All right. I'm going to go ahead and call the June 30th special meeting of the City of Santa Cruz Planning Commission to order. Uh, can we please uh, have a roll call? Commissioner Conway? Here. Greenberg? Kennedy? Maxwell? Here. C.D. Miller? Here. Different? Here. Chair Dawson? Here. All right. Uh, are there any uh, statements of disqualification? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on. Um, before we move into the two items on the agenda tonight, I just want to remind the public that this is a special meeting. So we're, we won't be having oral communications at, at this meeting and we'll just be hearing the two items before us. We'll move uh, forward on um, 109 South Repetta, item one. Um, if you're a member of the public and would like to comment on this item, um, now's a good time to call in. The order of events will be, we'll go ahead and get a staff report. We'll get any clarifying questions from commissioners um, and then uh, we'll uh, take any public comment and then come back to the commission for action. So uh, could we please have a staff report? Good evening, Chair Dawson and members of the Planning Commission. My name is Tim Mayer, Senior Planner with the City. Uh, this evening's first agenda item is the consideration of a major modification and map amendment related to 109 South Perpetta Road. The project applicant proposes a major modification and final map amendment to plan development permit project number 97-279, which was approved by the City Council on July 25th of 2000. The proposal would facilitate the request to amend the El Rancho Carbonera subdivision map to adjust the boundaries between two adjacent parcels containing existing townhouses and would also allow for residential development on lot B, a vacant lot separating the townhomes. Because the original entitlement was approved by the city council, the major modification and final map amendment, which are the subject of this evening's discussion, likewise require recommendation by the planning commission for approval by the city council. Uh, shown on this slide is the project site bordered in red surrounded by adjacent development. Lot B is an approximately 15,208 square foot vacant lot within the R17 or single family minimum 7,000 square foot lot size zone district and low density residential or L general plan land use designation. The property is located within the El Rancho Carbonera subdivision and serves as a boundary between city limits and unincorporated San Mateo, excuse me, Santa Cruz County land. Uh, Highway 17 is located directly to the west with single family residential development situated to the north, east, and south of the parcel. The approval of project 90, uh, number 97-279 on July 25th of 2000 allowed nine single family dwellings, two townhomes, and lot B or the subject parcel. The project included a tentative map, design permit, and plan development permit authorizing the development of a 3.4 acre former reservoir into a residential subdivision. As previously mentioned, the subject parcel lot B measures approximately 15,208 square feet in area and was created by project number 97-279 and designated as common open space. This slide shows a recorded subdivision map including the subject property, again, bordered in red. Uh, labels designating lot B, which is shown over here, as common area and public utility easement are visible um, in this portion of the slide that I'm circling. Uh, parcels one through nine shown toward the bottom of the slide are single family home lots and lots 10 and 11 shown over here um, are the parcels containing the townhomes. In January of 2012, the city became aware that the CCNRs for the subdivision were altered without the benefit of permits to remove lot B as common area. That action created inconsistency with condition number 19 of resolution 97-279 which states that the homeowners association shall not remove conditions and restrictions from the covenants, conditions and restrictions or CCNRs required by the city without first obtaining an amendment to the plan development and design permits. Additionally, the assessor's parcel map, including the lot was revised to remove the common area designation of lot B 
and the ownership of Lot B was transferred from the HOA to its present owner. In 2012, city staff made the applicant aware that the amendments were completed without city approval and were therefore not, re not recognized by the city. Later in March of 2013, the Rancho Carbonera Owners Association recorded a settlement agreement and release of all claims in which the HOA fully relinquished ownership of Lot B and any financial rights and responsibilities toward maintaining the lot as common open space for the subdivision. The applicant has provided a letter from the law firm which drafted the CCNRs uh, dated 2012, stating that Lot B was inadvertently described as common area in the CCNRs due to a clerical error and that subsequent actions were taken to remedy the original error. The attorney's uh, letter further states that the townhouse lots were not included in the CCNRs, although, the, although they were approved as part of the PD, and that only lot A and lot C were designated as common area for the subdivision. Lots A and C make up the two private streets, South Repetta Road and Misty Court, providing access from El Rancho Drive to the single family homes in the subdivision. This slide shows the configuration of lot B and the adjacent townhouse parcels as approved in 2000 as part of project 97-279. As part of the project, two alternative site plans have been prepared for your consideration. This slide exhibits the site plan proposed as part of alternative one, the alternative which is preferred by the applicant. In this alternative, the map amendment would adjust the property line between lot B and the two townhouse parcels to the east, transferring three off-street parking spaces approved as guest parking for the subdivision to the townhome lots with lot 10, which is APN 008-391-15, acquiring two spaces, and lot 11, which is APN 008-391-16, requiring one space. In alternative one, the units would remain designated as detached townhouses as allowed through the original plan development permit. And the boundaries between the townhouse lots would be revised to eliminate the portion of lot B, which separates the parcels with the rear line of each parcel modified to include an angled jog. Both parcels would be increased in size compared to their sizes as approved through project 97-279. In this alternative, alternative one, the applicant has additionally illustrated the footprint of a detached ADU or accessory dwelling unit in the rear portion of lot B over in this portion of the uh, slide shown here, um, which is also shown on the last page of the project plans for alternative one attached to the staff report. In alternative one, the subdivision continues to exceed the requirements for guest parking provided in section 2412-240 of the zoning ordinance as eight spaces are located along the private streets of Misty Court and South Repetta Road within the subdivision. This slide shows a tentative map for alternative one, including the revised parcel lines. Mitigation measure 10 of the initial study mitigated negative declaration or ISMND of project 97279, the original entitlement, which is condition of approval number 76 of that entitlement, requires ongoing maintenance of a 10 foot vegetative buffer, which is shown in green um, over on this slide here, uh, which serves as a transition space between rural county land and the suburban neighborhood of the Rancho Carbonero subdivision. In the second alternative site plan, alternative two, the shapes of both parcels would be modified as in the first alternative. However, the rear lot line of each parcel would be extended to align to the street frontage along El Rancho Drive. As recommended by staff, the size of each lot would be expanded to conform to the minimum lot size of 7,000 square feet as required for single family lots in the R17 zone district. Further, this option would allow the existing detached standalone townhouse lots to continue to function in a manner consistent with single family lots as effectively entitled through project number 97-279. Because the modified boundary lines would extend to El Rancho Drive, the parcels would, include, would enclose private yard areas, including gentler slopes, allowing greater functionality as outdoor amenity space when compared with lots of more limited size as presented in alternative one. The existing residential units would continue to serve as income restricted affordable housing stock in conformance with the participation agreement, which remains in effect. A tentative map has been submitted showing the revised boundary arrangement for alternative two. Shown in this slide is the subject lot, again, includes um, including revised parcel lines. As with alternative one, ongoing maintenance of the 10 foot vegetative buffer shown in green would be required. Prior to uh, 2015, the city's municipal code had permitted amendments to final maps only for correction of errors or omissions. 
In 2015, section 2344060 of the subdivision ordinance was adopted, allowing amendments to any final map or parcel map for reasons other than error or omission, if the necessary findings can be made. The new ordinance provides an opportunity to legalize the changes that were made to the CCNR's assessor's parcel map and into the ownership of lot B. Because the city council granted entitlement of the plan development permit in 2000, including adoption of the final El Rancho Carbonara subdivision map, again, approval by the city council of the proposed map amendment will be required following the planning commission's recommendation. The city of Santa Cruz municipal code section 2416-0201A states that affordable inclusionary housing requirements are applicable to all residential developments that create two or more new and or additional dwelling units or SRO units at one location. Because the proposed project would create only one ownership lot, the proposal is exempt from provision of additional affordable housing or payment of an equivalent in lieu fee uh, based on consultation with the city attorney. The subdivision would continue to comply with the inclusionary housing requirement through ongoing maintenance of a participation agreement, as I mentioned earlier, which allocates the two existing townhouses as affordable housing units. Further expansion of the lot sizes of the inclusionary residential units would bring the affordable lots into greater conformance with current affordable housing standards, which require affordable lots to be equivalent to market rate units and size. A tree survey and protection plan for the property was prepared on November 11th, 2020 and revised again on August 31st of 2021. That survey identifies the health and structure of 18 trees on lot B and recommends 11 for removal, including eight heritage trees due to poor condition or potent, potential for adverse impacts. The report also makes specific recommendations pertaining to the preservation of the seven trees, which will remain, including three heritage trees. The city's urban forester, Arborist, has reviewed and concurs with the recommendations of the Arborist report that was prepared for the project. The heritage trees removed will be required to be replaced in a two to one ratio, and 20% of the replacement trees must be coast live oaks in accordance with the conditions of approval of the original project. Due to the proximity of Lot B to Highway 17 and El Rancho Drive, an acoustic study was prepared to evaluate the impacts of unwanted sound of the site and to evaluate compliance with allowable thresholds for noise as specified in the city's general plan and as codified in the zoning ordinance. The acoustic study states that at the time of data collection, existing levels ex of exterior noise comply with standards specified in the general plan and that le levels of interior sound could be addressed through noise reducing equipment and techniques to ensure compliance with the conditions of approval of plan development permit number 97-279. A condition of approval has been added requiring compliance with noise standards. An initial study IS was prepared for plan development permit number 97-279 and a mitigated negative declaration or MND was adopted on July 25th of 2000 per requirements of the California Environment and Quality Act or CEQA. It's been determined that no additional CEQA analysis is necessary for this project because the modification to the original plan development permit um, and MAP amendments would qualify as a class five categorical exemption, which enables minor alterations and land use limitations. No substantial changes to the original circumstances um, under which the project would be undertaken or new information of substantial importance that would result in new significant impacts or a substantial increase in significance of previously identified impacts related to the project. Based on the level of previous environmental review, and due to the limited nature of proposed modifications, the class five categorical exemption is deemed appropriate for this project. No exceptions to the class five exemption pertain to the proposed project. Most site plan alternative one and alternative two would allow for compliance with the general plan and municipal code. For reasons outlined, staff recommend site plan alternative two. Staff have made the findings to support the proposed project. Under both alternatives, the allowable residential density of the general plan and the zoning designation, which allows up to 10 dwelling units per acre, would be maintained. The subdivision continues to exceed the requirements for guest parking for the zoning ordinance, again, as eight spaces are located along the private streets of Misty Court and South Repetta Road within the subdivision. Proposed amendments to approve plans are consistent with the reasons for approval of plan development permit 97279 and consistent with original conditions of approval of the project. Further, the habitat restoration and vegetation management plan required as a mitigation measure for the original subdivision entitlement would be retained and enforced. A biotic report prepared for the project in May of 2021 states that no special status plant species were identified 
or are expected to occur at the project site and that the project uh, site does not support any sensitive part, uh, plant communities. A biotic review letter prepared by the same consultants dated February 1st of 2022 confirms that the work associated with the habitat restoration and vegetation management plan was completed and continues to be maintained in accordance with the conditions of approval of plan development permit 97-279. Uh, shown on this slide are images of the project site, including existing non-native eucalyptus trees and surrounding vegetation. Uh, views of lot B appear here as well. A variety of foliage types and the overall state of the lot can be seen. Staff recommended a condition of approval be added to the project, aside from those already included in the staff report, requiring that the existing participation agreement or affordable housing agreement addressing the existing affordable units be updated to address the proposed changes to the lot. Um, that condition appears here on the slide near the top. With the added conditions of approval, staff have found the project to be consistent with all required site development standards and policies of the general plan. Staff recommend that the planning commission recommended the city council approval of site plan alternative two based on findings and conditions of approval attached to the staff report in the draft resolution. Staff and the applicant are available to answer questions and provide additional information as needed. Uh, this concludes staff's presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much for that staff report. Um, before we launch into this item, I just wanna quickly take the chair's prerogative after a little bit of a reflection over our last meeting. And I just wanna take this opportunity to remind us all as commissioners, my intent in running the meeting is to maintain decorum and order. And the primary way I do that is um, by us raising hands, waiting to be called on, and then waiting for other commissioners to speak. So I just wanna remind us all to do that. I will ensure you all that I will get to everyone. And also if we get in the weeds on parliamentary procedure, um, I'm gonna to look to staff for clarification on that. And I, I will ask them um, if we get in the weeds and anything. So just wanted to throw that out to all of us to make sure that we're um, having an orderly meeting so the public can follow and get the information um, that they need. So um, moving into clarifying questions on the 109 South Rapetta. So uh, does anybody have any clarifying questions? Looks like Commissioner Schifrin, uh, go ahead, please. Just have one at this time. Uh, during the staff presentation, there is a, um, a slide that showed the municipal code section that had to do with the ordinance change that allowed for uh, approval of um, unpermitted changes. I didn't get that code section number. Could you, um, it was 24. You're a commissioner Schiffer and I can uh, find that quickly here. Um, let's see, it's in the uh, subdivision ordinance title 23. Um, okay. It's uh, 23.44.060. That's the city's uh, subdivision ordinance. Um, I'm sorry, just a second. Let me get that. Sure, I'll, I can repeat that. Uh, 23.44.060. Okay, thank you very much. That's my only question at this time. Any other commissioners with any clarifying questions? Okay, so members of the public, um, we're gonna go out to public comment in a second. Now is the time to raise your hand. Um, if you're on the Zoom, you can use the raise hand feature. Um, if you're on the phone, you could press star nine to raise your hand. And we'll go ahead and go out to public comment for the public hearing. Um, when you're called upon, you will have three minutes and you will hear the clerk say time. Um, when you hear the clerk, please wrap up um, and finish your comments. Uh, everyone will have three minutes to speak. Uh, clerk, can we uh, call the a point of procedure? Doesn't, yep. uh, when there's an application, doesn't the applicant get a chance to make a presentation first before the public? Sure. Um, I mean, you might, we we'll, might want to check with staff to. As luck um, would have it, the applicant is the person in the uh, public queue that has their hand up. 
Okay, um, the applicant, you will have uh, longer than three minutes to go ahead and make your presentation. Um, uh, let's go ahead and go to the applicant, please. Good evening. Can you hear me? Good. Yes, thank you. Okay, go ahead. great. This is John Swift. I'm the applicant representing Steve Benedum. He's the property owner. So thank you very much for the staff report, Timothy. It was very thorough. Uh, a lot of background information on this. I was involved in the original subdivision, uh, and I think it's worthwhile to, to take a moment to think back how this thing evolved. We originally proposed seven townhouses and 14 units down on the old reservoir that was re re, uh, redeveloped. And this, through the process of going through city, city planning review and that kind of thing, this thing got reduced down to two townhouse lots and nine lots. These nine lots are consistent with the 7,000 square foot zoning, the R17 zoning. The townhouses are up, of course, on this lot, and that open space was relevant to those townhouses. The lot B was never part of the HOA. That was never, is in the DRE final, uh, uh, final report, does not include the, these, this lot B in the final report. Um, so there's the CCNRs, we can get into details, but the CCNR has two pages. The first page shows uh, both parcels A, B, and C, and parcel B is included. The next page, if you go back through this in detail, uh, it did not include parcel B. The change that was made was to correct that inconsistency. That was, that was The CCNRs were approved by the staff, but it was an inconsistent document. So we, we corrected that and uh, that was the issue that occurred there. So the point now is we're faced with a, a change in times when density uh, is considered uh, not necessarily a bad thing as back in 2000, housing was not necessarily a public good. It was actually a kind of a um, negative, if you were, will, or a scourge. And uh, in essence, it was uh, very strongly uh, discouraged. And we ended up with uh, quite a few different lots, quite a few less lots. So we have reviewed the staff report. We think it's generally uh, a good staff report. There are a couple of conditions we have concerns about. We do prefer alternative one. Uh, alternative one we think provides the opportunity for accessory dwelling unit behind the two existing townhouses. The two existing townhouse lots were approved in the configuration that you've seen. They are detached lots or detached townhouses on separate lots. We are making them Alternative one makes them a little bit bigger, a little bit more consistent with the zoning ordinance. Doesn't make them all the way consistent with R17 standards, but that was never required in the first place. So taking this unused parcel, parcel B, uh, it's been uh, agreed by the uh, HOA of the nine homes, which again, never really had an interest in this parcel. It was. They never owned or had an interest, but they did recognize that in this settlement agreement. And uh, we're taking that parcel that is has been unused and turning it into a worthwhile uh, a housing opportunity for both the main dwelling and an ADU. So it is the, the owner's preference to have alternative one. And uh, we hope that you'll give that some consideration. Uh, the condition that we're concerned about is condition 17, which calls for the inclusion of parcel B, which would now be this house and ADU into the HOA uh, itself for the nine homes. Again, this would be a, a change from what was originally proposed because the, again, the HOA never included parcel B or these two townhomes. So, to add this to the HOA would be, I, I believe it would require that HOA to approve that addition, which they have indicated in the past they were not interested in that property and they approved the development of this single house on this parcel, which they do not use, have no interest in using. And we also have letters from the tenants of the two townhouse units. They also support this project and have not they uh, admit that they have not used this parcel, really have no use for it. So it is a, the general plan, it's also important to note, the general plan includes policies that talk about infill development and encouraging the housing development on 
these remnant or infill parcels. And that is what this is. Uh, it's a re uh, remaining parcel from a subdivision that really uh, was developed at a time when density was discouraged. Times have changed. There is a need for housing, and this is an attempt to provide additional housing. Um, and it's, we're walking a thin line also in, in the sense of what is consistent with the neighborhood, what the homeowner association down below has supported versus uh, more housing, so to speak, an even denser project. So uh, the condition number 17, again, we don't understand the logic as to why this house or lot would be included in the uh, HOA below for the nine homes. Uh, so we would like some discussion on that point and consideration of striking that condition number 17. So with that, I'll conclude my presentation to be available for any questions or comments and further discussion. Thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and is there any clarifying questions um, from commissioners uh, to the applicant before we go to public comment? Go ahead, Commissioner Conway. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thanks for letting us know um, uh, the perspective. Um, on the point of the, the is, is this new lot, would it be the only lot in the development that isn't part of the HOA? So all the rest of the um, housing is um, organized um, through the HOA? And I, should I answer that? Yes, go ahead, Mr. Swift. Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So no, the townhouse lots have never been part of the HOA. So there would be all that, those properties north of Repetta Road, which would be the three, have not and would not be part of the HOA. And again, that was part of the original confusion in that document, which in, on one page included them, on the other page did not. The DRE final report did not include either of these, it explicitly uh, um, eliminates those three from the DRE final report. And we can share, I think uh, Timothy has that document, he might be able to put it up or we can share it with you. I can read the paragraph that specifically eliminates that, but if you'd like. Does, does that answer your question, Commissioner Conroy? Okay, I think we're all, all good, Mr. Swift. Um, any other clarifying questions for the applicant before we go out to see if there's any public comment? Yes, Commissioner Kennedy, please. Uh, so I just want to be clear. So the, the whole new alternate design has developed since June 2nd at at the, you know, to, uh, in conjunction with staff or that was there before? So alternative one was there before. Alternative yeah. two has become staff's recommendation uh, through discussions with them back and forth. And, and I'll let Timothy elaborate on that. I just, I, I saw the report. I just wanted to kind of understand that process yeah. and the back and forth there a little bit more. Sure, uh, Commissioner Kennedy, uh, you're right. So what happened is following the initial um, consent agenda item on uh, June the 2nd, uh, staff uh, um, through further kind of review of the project realized that uh, due to kind of the functionality of the townhouse lots is detached without shared kind of open amenity space between them, they really effectively function as single family lots. So the recommendation was made to just um, as, uh, present fully conforming lots. The In alternative two, the lots aren't fully conforming, but they do have the lot size required in the R17 zone district. And part of that was because the um, you know, part of the, the open space area, the private open space area behind those townhouse lots was kind of heavily, is slightly, you know, steep and slope and continuing the lots to the, uh, um, the street frontage uh, would give private open space that was more usable. Okay, and it sounds like there's some unclarity way back to that original subdivision, um, even before June. So I sympathize. Thank you. Okay, any other commissioners have questions for staff or the applicant? Okay, um, now we'll go ahead and go out for public comment. Uh, any members of the public who would like to speak on this item, now is the time to raise your hand. If you're on Zoom, you can use the raise hand feature down at the bottom. If you are on a phone, please press 
star nine now. We have a few seconds for the delay to see if anyone would like to speak. Okay, clerk, I am not seeing any hands. Could you please confirm? I do not see any hands either. Okay. We'll go ahead and um, close the public comment then, and we will bring it back to uh, the commission for discussion and action. I see Commissioner Schifrin, please go ahead. I have a number of questions. Uh, I wanted to hear from the public as well, the applicant before asking them. I'm finding it somewhat confusing, understanding the difference between what was in the HOA and what was in the subdivision that was originally approved by the council. My understanding is that the subdivision included the two townhouse lots and the common open space lot, whatever its number is now, whatever its letter is now, that was approved in the original uh, conditions of approval as common open space for the um, overall subdivision. Is, is that not correct? I guess I'm asking staff. Yes, staff, could you shed some light on that for us, please? Sure. Um, it, it's a little, uh, a little difficult to decipher, but the original description of lot B as including the CCNRs that John, uh, Mr. Swift spoke to earlier, does include a uh, lot B as, as um, open space, common open space, and it's labeled that way in the recorded maps. Um, that's the information that we have accessible to us, uh, whether um, as you know, Mr. Swift described um, that part of it, we, um, you know, the kind of the original tent, unfortunately, we just don't have very good written records indicating uh, that that aspect is is what was in front of the staff at the time not to say that it's not it's just difficult to decipher because of the nature of the subdivision um it's uh, but but again to kind of reiterate uh, what i mentioned earlier is the information we had both in the ccnrs and in the subdivision map do show that lot b is uh, a common area and the subdivision map shows the two affordable units it doesn't indicate them as affordable, um, but it does show those townhouse lots, correct? Yeah. Okay, so what I'm understanding then, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the HOA was set up, which was supposed to reflect the what was in the subdivision, but it excluded the affordable units in a common open space. Um, and while that was the, uh, what were the testimony, if I'm understanding it, that that was the original intention of the uh, homeowners association. It doesn't sound like it was the original intention of the council when it approved the subdivision because it included the townhouse units and it included the common open space. And the CCNRs do talk about common open space. Uh, it's not really clear where, you know, the streets are common open space. Um, but it's not really clear what all they include. Um, but even if it's true that they don't include um, the, the uh, common open space parcel and the two townhouse units, uh, that does seem like an inconsistency with the uh, approval that the city council gave to the project uh, and the, you know, the origin the, and the subdivision map. So you have a subdivision map, which creates a subdivision, and part of it is in the homeowners association, and part of it isn't in the homeowners association. Is that normal? Um, in response to that, Commissioner Schifrin, it's not totally out of um, the realm of possibility. There, uh, I've, I've experienced this in, in other projects where a PD was. Um, entitled and kind of ex explicitly or implicitly exempted certain parcels. It, so it, it does happen from time to time. It's not standard though. And um, uh, in response to the item regarding the townhouse lots, 
Um, the CCNR is actually do mention that lots 10 and 11, which were the designations given to those townhomes, um, townhouse lots, uh, were, were not included as part of the CCNR. So um, the, the notion with lot B is, is a bit more murky because the CCNRs do mention lot B as open space, um, but, but further there's a description of open space that does not include lot B. So it's that, that aspect of it is a bit challenging, but again, um, going back to the kind of the early days of the project, um, lot B as staff understood it was intended to be open space that was part of the plan development. Okay, um, I guess there's another legal question. Can the, given that this, um, app, you know, the changes to the CCNRs and the uh, selling off of the common open space was not anticipated in the original uh, city council approval, could the commission recommend just denial of this application? Are we under any legal obligation now that we're in a, time that uh, density suddenly um, is desirable. I don't really agree that it was ever uh, as negatively considered as we heard, but um, is there any legal requirement that the, uh, that the city, uh, that the commission recommend and the city council approve this, um, this application, particularly since one of the required findings in uh, section 2444060A is that there are changes in circumstances that make any or all of the conditions of the map no longer appropriate or necessary. And I'm not sure what those uh, would be. So I'm not sure uh, you know, whether it would be required that the commission make these findings and recommend approval of this application. So to cut to the chase, can we legally deny uh, the application? Um, Staff, do you want to weigh in on that? I'm sorry, Commissioner Dawson. Oh, so um, the this evening the the commission is asked to um, uh, to recommend to the city council um, approval, or that can be uh, not recommended if if the commission so chooses. So. Um, I believe that the commission can recommend um, against approval to the city council. Thank you. Mr. Schifrin, did you have additional questions? I wonder, is there any information on the height of the trees that are proposed to be cut down? There are a couple of, there's a few uh, trees on the site that are really large and I think serve as you know, important noise buffers. The site is extremely noisy. It's so close to Highway 17, having gone out there. Um, I, I think the noise study understates it a little bit. Um, but I, I just wonder if there is any information on the height of these trees that are going to be uh, removed. Sure, Commissioner Schiffman, we there is a, an arborist report, I believe that should be attached to the staff report. Um, I, don't, I uh, didn't see height as th that may not have been included. They're, they're mature trees, though, to your point. They're sizable. Um, having visited a lot, I, I understand that they are quite large. Um, I don't know whether the height was, was referenced. I can quickly try to find that information. I don't think it is in the Arborist report because I looked for it, but I could be wrong. Okay, those are my questions. Okay. Thank, thank you. Um, any other commissioners uh, have any questions or would like to make a motion? Uh, Commissioner Conway. Yeah. <clears throat> I guess my comments on this would be that uh, to me, it does not make sense to not have the townhouse lots included um, in the HOA. I understand why that would be added. Um, 
just for the reason of um, the HOA, you know, deliberates and makes decisions on matters of common interest. Um, I understand there might be an argument against it, but to me, I, I support a condition that would include them um, in the HOA. Um, and particularly since they're both, um, they're the affordable units, um, it's uncomfortable that, that uh, they wouldn't have a role in common matters. That's, you know, my somewhat shallow take on it. Um, the other thing um, I guess I would say is I would support the staff recommendation where the lots go all the way back. I can see that as far as usability um, and of that open space, I think it's a better use of the lot. That's where I'd come in. Thank you, Commissioner Conway. Um, any commissioners want to make a motion or any other comments? Uh, we had a quick toddler visit there, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> so I just feel that this went from a consent item, you know, to this whole other thing in this month. And I really feel like our job here is to encourage housing and to free up the, de the developer to do whatever they'd like to get as many units as possible. So I really have strong reservations about uh, not going with the staff recommendation, but I'm in favor of alternative one here. Let's put it back and, and let this guy go on his way. Like if I could, I would vote to put it back on the consent agenda right now. Uh. Okay, well, uh, does anyone want to make a motion for an action of some sort? Uh, Commissioner Schifrin. Well, as you heard, I have a lot of uh, reservations about this application overall. I think it's really um, the integrity of the process is it, you know, is in question here. The idea that city council approving common open space, but then it isn't common open space, it's sold off. And, you know, I certainly like to suggest that in the future with subdivisions, that if there is a requirement for common open space, there also be a requirement or a condition that there be a, a conservation easement put on the common open space so that some future um, if that's what the city council wants, that's what should be allowed uh, and not that it can just be ignored. And then 20 years later it comes back and say, oh, now you really like housing. So let me do whatever I want. Um, having said that, um, I agree with Commissioner Conway that um, alternative two is a much more desirable approach than alternative one, um, given the um, you know, the realities and with the, you know, proposed condition number uh, 17. So in order to move this along <clears throat> with some reluctance and reservation, I would move uh, the staff recommendation on this item uh, with alternative two. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion on the floor to approve the staff recommendation uh, with a second by Commissioner Conway. Um, we'll go ahead um, and bring this to a vote. Uh, can we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Conway? Aye. Kennedy? No. Maxwell? Aye. Masidi Miller? Aye. Jeffrey? Aye. Chair Dawson? Aye. Uh, motion passes, and we will move along to item number two, um, objective development standards for multifamily and mixed-use housing ordinance amendments. We'll have the same order of events. We'll have a staff report, uh, clarifying questions, uh, public comment, and then back to the commission for action. We have a staff report, please. Hi, good evening, commissioners. Sarah Doisy um, with the Advanced Planning Division. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. 
Uh, let's get started on round two of our um, objective standards project. Okay, can everyone see that? Great. Okay, so tonight we're going to go through a little bit of background on the project, uh, and then I'm going to get right into it, talking about the amendments that we're making to our existing zones, multifamily residential zones and commercial zones. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the new mixed use um, zone districts that are proposed to be created. Those will be implementing the land use pattern in the 2030 general plan and rezoning um, a number of parcels. The, then we'll talk about the amendments to our development review process and ways that um, applicants, project applicants might choose to vary from these objective design standards that we've just created. Then we'll talk um, lastly, or our last two topics are about inclusionary ADUs and, and replacement housing. Those are kind of um, discussed together. And then we have a section on two new definitions that were, well, one definition we're amending and one new definition we're adding, proposing to add to the Muni code. And then we'll get to our recommendation. So a little bit of background. This is part two of two for the planning commission and uh, as the final components of this project to develop objective development standards and reconcile the mismatch between the city's adopted 2030 general plan and our existing zoning ordinance. Um, this project was initiated to first and foremost reconcile that existing mismatch between our, our general plan and our zoning ordinance. Um, our general plan was adopted in 2012 and we have not yet had zoning code that fully implements the envisioned um, land use intensities of that plan. I'll talk more about that when I get to those mixed use zone districts later. We're also doing this project to further comply with state law, which now sort of restricts the discretion that local jurisdictions have when reviewing housing development. We did get some, some direction from the city council that in resolving this mismatch and creating these um, objective development standards that we were gonna do this through the zoning ordinance. We were not gonna be proposing any adjustments to the land use pattern of our general plan as part of this project. So our first hearing on the second of this month um, focused on the site and building design standards as they were proposed. Your commission reviewed those um, several weeks ago. And then this hearing addresses sort of these other related issues and completes this task of uh, bringing all of these pieces together. So first let's get into our amendments to our existing zones. So first I just want to acknowledge there are, so, there are a couple of cleanup items that you may have noticed sort of sprinkled throughout the text in all of these zone districts. Um, there's a change in state law and how daycare homes are regulated, small and large daycare homes. Um, and then also we recently completed and, and completed review with the Coastal Commission of our wireless telecommunications facilities ordinance. Um, we just did a big update of that. And so um, there is there are changes in the zone districts that now recognize that certain um, wireless facilities are can be reviewed without a public hearing and others do require a public hearing. So you'll see that throughout um, all of the zone districts as well. So in our RL and our RM zone districts, which are our two primary mixed use, um, sorry, multifamily, not mixed use. These are exclusively residential multifamily zones. RL is our low density multifamily. It has a, a density of between 20 and 28-ish um, dwelling units per acre and our RM zone, which has a density of between 30 and 39 dwelling units per acre. We made no changes to the use standards or we're recommending, pardon me, no changes to the use standards or levels of review for the uses in those zone districts. We, did, we are recommending um, a minor change in the way that we um, calculate and apply required side yard setbacks. So the change that we're recommending goes from um, relying exclusively on the height of the building to also taking into account the number of stories that are included. It allows the building to taper. It creates this um, uh, requirement for articulation when a building exceeds two stories of height. And this also allows more of the building area to be on the lower two levels rather than um, making the whole building be sort of narrower and taller. Um, there also is uh, the RH zone is included in our zoning package. There aren't very many sites in the city that carry the RH zoning. This is a picture of one of them on um, Galt Street or next, I'm sorry, it's on Hanover off of Galt. 
And we're not recommending any changes to the use standards or the site standards in this zone district, but it has a lot of very specific design standards that are in conflict with the objective design standards that we just reviewed at the last hearing. So we're recommending that we strike those and instead make reference to both um, any area plans that might govern on these sites and then also to the objective design standards. And then there are several changes also in the beach area zones. I just want to acknowledge I did not discuss these in the um, staff report. That was an oversight on my part. So I'm going to just spend a, a little bit of extra moment on this um, this evening. So the beach south of Laurel area plan, when that was um, written back in the 90s, in order to implement that, it required the creation of several like very specific and very like hyper localized zone districts. Um, so some of these zone districts um, actually literally only apply to like one or two parcels. So um, they're, they're, they're highly specific. And so they're shown here on this map. So we have the RTA, which is shown here in this um, like dark orange color. We have the RTB, which is in this sort of um, hatched, whoops, all right. Oh, goodness, I have a sensitive mouse, sorry. Uh, this sort of hatched color is the RTB. Um, and it's also over here. And then we have the RTD, that's the other um, residential, these are all the residential beach area zones, and then the RTE. Um, so in these zone districts, we did actually change some of the residential uses. So in these zone districts, they are identified for residential use. That's part of the purpose um, stated in the zone district. And yet in, in many cases, those residential uses required use permits. And um, given the changes in state law, we don't really see the benefit of continuing to require use permits for residential uses. It gets a little bit tricky, especially if there's no residential use that is principally permitted in those zones. So um, we um, reduced the level of review for residential uses in these residential zones and made residential uses principally permitted. And we deleted any distinction that was based on project size. So a lot of these zone districts had carried a distinction between, you know, three to nine units was one level of review and 10 or more units was a, was a higher level of review. And we don't think that's really as functional as it was when this text was originally written. So we're recommending that we reduce those to being principally permitted and rely on our design permit process to review the design of those, of those project proposals. Um, we're not making changes to the site standards or densities in these zone districts and the commercial, any commercial uses that were previously allowed continue to be allowed. We didn't make any changes to those or to the levels of review of those in these four zone districts. So now in our commercial zone districts, we did make some changes. So in our CT, which is our commercial thoroughfare, that's kind of a long river street. And there's, um, I think some of it goes on the other side of highway one along river street. Um, the CN, a neighborhood commercial, that's in some tiny pockets, like sort of mixed into neighborhoods. There's some in Seabright, there's some on the west side in the Circles neighborhood. Um, there's some other sort of smaller sites that are sort of like one-off kind of scattered around. Um, the CB, which is beach commercial, that's largely, it's mostly actually the boardwalk and the wharf is on CB. It's shown here on this map in this darker pink color. So it does wrap around the corner. This is the... Um, parking lot for the, um, the uh, one parking lot for the boardwalk. And then um, it catches a couple of parcels along um, the street right here and then along the frontage there. Um, and then the PA, which is our professional administrative zone district, that's primarily located along Mission Street, um, like at the northern part of Mission Street, but there are sort of pockets of it as well along Soquel um, and elsewhere in the city. So in these areas, um, mixed use has been allowed. And at this point, and then so in this update, um, we're sort of clarifying and consolidating those uses. We're stating that active uses are required at the ground floor. So um, we talked about with the design standards on the second, how we wanted to have active frontages in a lot of these commercial areas. And so in, in adopting these, in amending these zoning ordinances, what we're doing is creating uses for active frontage. And we're making mixed use a principally permitted use and putting some limits around standalone residential. You will see a couple of zones where it currently allows standalone residential. And so we, we still do allow like limited circumstances where standalone residential 
could happen if there's not enough site area to do mixed use or to do um, multifamily development. You can do sort of standalone um, single family dwellings in some of these zone districts. But in general, um, the density that's required or that's allowed, sorry, on these um, in these zones is the is RM's density or RL density. So there is a density that's established in these four zone districts. And so with those densities, with the site standards that already apply on these um, for these zones, with the height limits, with the floor area ratio from the general plan, you can meet those densities within the site standards that are allowed. So we're not me recommending making any changes to those site standards because that density is still limited. On the other hand, in the community commercial, the CC zone and the RTC, which is that other um, sort of beach commercial zone uh, in the um, along the beach area, active uses are encouraged rather than required. So in these two zone districts, the current code and the code as it stood on January 1st, 2018, which is the state law sort of threshold that we're called back to, um, allows standalone residential development and it allows specifically SROs. So single room occupancy, which is the most, the densest type of housing that the city allows. And it currently, those are currently allowed as standalone uses in those zone districts. So we feel that in order to comp comply with state law, we need to maintain that allowance. So that's what these are recommending. It will, they do um, allow for this type of development to happen, SROs to happen as standalone projects because that is the current condition. So um, you'll recall, you may recall that um, when we approved the flexible density units, when we made that change at the end of last year, um, we also added for that um, a mixed use requirement in a few of the zone districts. So in the downtown, we added that. And, um, and in the beach commercial, we added a requirement for mixed use for, to use those flexible density units. At the time, we did not add that mixed use requirement to the CC zone. And so that's reflected again here, where in the CC zone, we would allow a standalone development of those flexible density units, which again, are a little bit bigger than SROs. It's um, for, the, for our newer, uh, planning commissioners or any members of the public, a flexible density unit is a type of unit that replaced um, a, a type of unit that the city had had in the past called a small ownership unit. So they're a little bit bigger than um, SROs, but they're still tend to be, they're under um, 620 square feet, I think, or 600 square feet. Uh, so they're really, you know, studios or one bedrooms, small units. So in both of these zone districts, the CC and the RTC, larger units are allowed in either of these two conditions. So as mixed use, in the CC, our existing condition is there's no density established when it's a mixed use development project. There's no residential density established. And in the RTC, there is a residential density established. It's based on the RTA zone, which is essentially 30 dwelling units per acre. So that density limit stays in place in the RTC. Um, and that mixed use standard reflects our current condition. And then the piece that we're adding is that for standalone residential in these areas, we will allow standalone residential development when the ground floor is developed as live work units. So that requires higher floor plates. Those ground floor plates have to be 15 feet tall. And um, we set some standards for that in the um, package of standards that your commission reviewed on the second. So all of those standards would, reply, would apply to the ground floor um, residential uses in these zone districts. And then there would also be a density limit established. And this reflects the current condition that in when you're doing residential only in the CC, it's an RM density. And when you're doing um, residential only in the RTC, it's the RTA density. And in both cases, that's essentially 30 units per acre. So um, in terms of site standards, the floor area ratio, the setbacks are unchanged in these, um, in all of these zone districts. The heights are unchanged everywhere except in the CC. So in the community commercial CC zone district, we are recommending that we allow an additional five feet of height for a mixed use project. The current height limit in the CC is 40 feet, three stories and 40 feet. And um, we think that five additional five feet of height just adds a little bit of flexibility to accommodate more um, of the retail ground floor and active uses that we want to see. 
um, the standards for residential open space have been updated in all of these zone districts. So regardless of the density that they're allowed to use for mixed use, either the you know RL, low density multifamily or the RM or the RTA, which is essentially the same as RM, we're recommending the same open space requirement, which is 80 square feet of common open space and 40, a minimum, these are minimums, minimum of 40 square feet of private open space. Um, for the commercial uses themselves within these zone districts, they're each categorized within each zone. And we, so we added, what we added were um, categories. So we, we added um, call outs for um, residential uses, commercial uses, and then we created uses for active frontage and just sort of reorganized the existing uses that were allowed and, and placed them into those categories. So it will, it'll be clear to readers what their palette of choices is when they're looking at a use to occupy a space that has to be a use for active frontage, what uses qualify as residential uses um, and how are those listed in each zone district. We left the levels of review unchanged for commercial uses and we also added clarifications throughout that design permits are required for new structures in these zone districts. So now I'll talk about our new mixed use zones that we're proposing that will be implementing the general plan and the Ocean Street area plan. So we got a fair amount of correspondence from folks who are concerned about how tall buildings meet up with R1 zones. Um, and are asking that your commission um, decline to rezone certain areas for um, a higher density um, zone district and instead go for a lower density, slightly lower density zone district. I'm going to explain why staff is not recommending that. So um, the general plan adopted in, in 2030 lays out four goals for our land use pattern, sustainable land uses, a compact community with boundaries defined by the city's Green Belt and Monterey Bay, a complementary balance of diverse land uses, and land use patterns that facilitate alternative transportation and or minimize transportation demand. These are the four goals that are set out in the land use chapter of our general plan. And the way that these goals work together, then they, then they filter down into policies and those policies filter into programs. And then all together, those policies and programs led to identifying the parcels shown on this map to be redesignated in the last general plan update. The parcels that are shown colored here are the parcels that we are rezoning tonight or proposing to rezone tonight. Um, they are parcels that were identified for increased residential intensity mixed with commercial uses. These are parcels that are located along transportation corridors. They are close to, they're in our co existing commercial core and nodes and um, these are places where um, we decided to focus our new development rather than spreading it throughout existing neighborhoods or or looking into green fields or taking up our industrial land that could be otherwise used for employment um, these are the the sites that were identified for really capturing the bulk of the change um, during the up until 2030. And so these are the sites that we're talking about rezoning tonight. To set the state law context that we're working in at this point, which let's be clear, this is a different state law context than we were working under when we adopted the general plan. And this is where we are today. So the Housing Crisis Act and the Housing Accountability Act, to summarize, essentially say we must allow for the development of housing, all jurisdictions, not just Santa Cruz, um, the standards must allow for the planned residential capacity of a property to actually be built. And that takes us back to January 1st, 2018. Whatever was allowed on that date is what we must allow at this point moving forward, unless we want to um, start moving, moving things around. So the capacity of the zoning or the general plan, whichever is greater. So that's what we are obligated to um, accept applications relative to and process in terms of development. That's what we are doing now. We saw that with the 831 water development. Um, that was an SB 35 application, which came in and which we reviewed against our objective standards. And that property, I think they didn't even hit the, the allowed floor area ratio from the general plan. So that's what we're, that's kind of the scale of development that we're considering when we're considering the, um, 
poor area ratios that are called for in the general plan and the amount of housing that's really planned for those sites and the state law says we have to accommodate. We can't use subjective standards to limit the amount of housing. Um, we can't reduce the intensity of land use and reductions could be any of the following reductions in height, density, floor area ratio, <clears throat> excuse me, lot coverage, or increases in setbacks, open space, and minimum parcel size. So when we were creating the site standards proposed for these mixed use zone districts, we relied on the test fits that we did with our consultants on the um, objective design standards where we like analyzed, you know, what does it mean to have 2.75 floor area ratio with our parking standards? And what kind of uh, an open space requirement can we have on these parcels and still have everything kind of fit together? And then what does that mean? How do we take that test and have it apply to lots of different kinds of parcel geometry, right? So, um, so that's like the thinking that goes into setting these standards. And I will admit this is an art rather than an exact science. So there's definitely room for discussion on these. Um, so all of these mixed use zone districts require uses for active frontage. They support mixed use and they allow 100% commercial development. So because these sites are really in our existing commercial core, we wanted to be sure that someone could still come in and do a 100% commercial development if that was um, what the market demanded or if there were um, ways or reasons that a property owner would want to do that because this is also, these lands are also um, relied upon for employment generation and neighborhood services. So all the commercial uses in the mixed use zones are based on existing uses in the community commercial, the CC zone. Um, most of these parcels are currently zone CC, over 90% are currently in that zone district. <clears throat> um, the Ocean Street zones do, uh, the mixed, proposed mixed use zones encourage more commercial use and visitor serving uses. And that's based on the, um, the goals and policies that are in the Ocean Street area plan, um, which really focus, talks about using um, Ocean Street as a place, as a commercial corridor that is serving visitors and locals that allows for mixed use, which is a bit different than um, the, uh, the areas that are identified in the general plan for mixed use medium density and mixed use high density, which are really talked about as housing in a mixed use context. <clears throat> so the site standards that we're recommending for each of these zone districts were um, based on the adopted general plan and the Ocean Street area plan. The heights were determined based on looking at the floor area ratio, as I mentioned in the general plan. And then in the Ocean Street area plan, there are actually stories, minimum and maximum established for each of these locations. So um, that's what you're going to see on these next slides as we go through each of the zone districts. I have one correction that I'd like to point out um, on the summary sheet. There's a summary sheet in your packet that lists all six of the zone districts and it has this footnote on it, which I actually have made one tiny amendment to. Um, we intended to include this footnote in each of the six zone districts and I missed doing that. So it is my intention to do that. And this is part of our staff recommendation is that this be included with each zone district as we move forward to city council. So I just want to point that out for everyone. The intention was that it be in the code and it's not reflected there, but we will make that correction before we go to council. So this talks about um, matching setbacks to any residential neighbor. If the, if the residential neighbor has a larger setback, then the mixed use project would have to match that setback. And then it also talks about, um, it just makes sure there's a cross-reference to um, the neighborhood transition plane, which is that 45 foot plane, which starts at three stories and ensures that any um, higher stories are pulled back from, um, from any residential neighbors or R1 neighbors. Okay, so our first zone district, the mixed use medium density is um, located on Mission Street in a few clusters. Uh, this area carries a general plan land use designation of mixed use medium density, which establishes a floor area ratio of 1.75 and a density for um, those larger two plus bedrooms of between 10 and 30 dwelling units per acre. So the height that we're recommending for commercial use is three stories and 40 feet. That's actually the same height and stories limit that is currently in place in the CC zone district for these parcels. <clears throat> um, three stories and 40 feet. And then for mixed use, we're recommending that we allow one more story. 
and an additional five feet of height. So four stories and 45 feet of height. These are the parcels that are um, proposed to be rezoned to the mixed use high density. Um, these parcels are on Soak Hill and then in two clusters along Water Street at Water and Branson 40 and at Water and Morrissey. They carry a general plan land use designation of mixed use high density with a maximum floor area ratio of 2.75. Oops. Sorry. The density for those uh, that's established for these uses in those, these areas in the general plan is um, between 10 and 55 dwelling units per acre for those two or two bedrooms or more units. So in, this, in these areas, we're recommending for commercial uses that the maximum height be four stories and 50 feet, and for mixed use that it be five stories and 55 feet. Um, and now the Ocean Street zone. So the Ocean Street zones, I'll just point out the, um, the uses vary just a little bit from the uses that are um, proposed in, in the mixed use medium density and mixed use high density. Um, primarily in, in moving lodging uses into principally permitted because the, the goals for in the Ocean Street area plan really is want Ocean Street to become more of a visitor serving area. And that's also um, the goal of the one of the land use designations in the general plan that applies here in Ocean Street. So that's all of the Ocean Street area zones have the same uses at the same levels all the way through. Um, and what varies between them is the site standards. So, um, and the site standards are based on this Venn diagram of what's required in the general plan, what's allowed in the general plan and what's allowed in the Ocean Street area plan. So uh, mixed use medium density, Ocean Street medium density, floor area ratio of 1.75, density of 10 to 30 dwelling units per acre, um, recommending height for commercial three stories and 45 feet, height for mixed use three stories and 40 feet, um, and then also a minimum height of one story and 16 feet. And this, we're talking about these sites that are shown here in this lightest orange color. So here at Barson and Ocean, here in the middle part of Ocean across from um, the county building and the Paradox. And then um, here on the on the back side of, you know, these parcels front onto Ocean and these front onto May and Hubbard, and then up here at the top of Ocean Street as well at Washburn. Mixed use Ocean Street high density. Um, this is this darker orange color um, up here and then down here at um, Ocean and Broadway. Uh, these also carry that mixed use general plan of mixed use medium density. So they also have a FAR of 1.75, but the Ocean Street area plan actually calls for more height in this zone. So four stories, and 55 feet is what we're recommending for commercial. Um, for mixed use, we're recommending four stories and 50 feet, and the minimum height here it would be two stories and 24 feet. So mixed use visitor serving high density, this lighter blue color, so it's here along Soquel and Ocean, and then also over here on Riverside, this one little spot. Um, these couple little parcels here on Leonard, and then otherwise this intersection, the three corners of this intersection at Water and Ocean. So this carries a general plan land use designation of mixed use visitor commercial, which has a maximum FAR of 2.75 um, and a density for those larger units of between zero and 55 dwelling units per acre. So here, the Ocean Street area plan caps height at four stories. So we're recommending a height for commercial development of four stories and 55 feet for mixed use of four stories and 50 feet, and then a minimum um, for all uses of two stories and 20. 24 feet. And then our last Ocean Street zone, this is the mixed use visitor serving additional height. This is the darkest blue color here. So it's um, along Broadway and Ocean here on Dakota. And then, um, oh geez. And then also the, the county, the site with the county building right here. So um, this also carries a designation of mixed use visitor commercial with that same FAR 2.75 and density of zero to 55 DU per acre. Um, this, the Ocean Street area plan sets a six story height standard for this area. So we're recommending six stories and 75 feet for commercial and um, six stories and 70 feet for mixed use and a minimum height of three stories and 40 feet for all uses. So um, I also included this slide that just sort of puts all the zone districts together so you can uh, compare them across the board. Um, the 
the density for each of these that's established is reflected on in the it has been reflected in the zoning ordinance in the um, the version of this summary that's in your packet it says there's no zoning density established we actually decided to put it in the zoning ordinance so there is a density established and it's based on exactly what it comes out of the general plan <clears throat> in terms of the lot area required per unit So um, in order for rezonings to be processed, your commission needs to make uh, the following two findings. One, that the public necessity, the general community welfare, and good zoning practice shall be served and furthered. And second, that the proposed amendment is in general conformance with the principles, policies, and land use designations set forth in the general plan, the local coastal program, and any area adopted area or specific plan that may apply. So we believe these findings um, can be made in that um, this, by rezoning these properties, we're creating transparency. As I've explained, the a capacity that's allowed in the general plan can be built today. Uh, we are required to review development applications that come in using that full FAR amount. And even if our zoning can't accommodate that in the existing you know, three-story, 40-foot height limit, we still have to accept those applications and process them and review them with objective standards that can accommodate that full amount of development capacity. So um, we do believe it's a, a good public service to make that very transparent and very clear to people what can be built on properties um, all throughout the city. Um, we also think it is good zoning practice to concentrate development in places where there are options for jobs, where there are <clears throat> options for transportation, where not every car, every trip has to be made with a car. Um, we also are, we also have kept these rezonings exclusively to those parcels that are identified in the general plan with these land use designations. So we are implementing the general plan and going no further. Um, and then the height limits that were um, proposing are exactly those that are reflected in the Ocean Street area plan. So now I'll talk about the amendments to our development review policy. So this is, we're making these changes to recognize that um, under these state laws, as I've mentioned, our local discretion in housing development has really been altered. And our, um, it makes sense to adjust our process to recognize that. Um, the situation where we find ourselves currently is that we have um, several types of projects that require public hearings at which we can't apply different standards or use our discretion in the in the way that we are accustomed to. And so um, we're just looking for ways to help all of us help the public understand and make sense of this new reality and understand where they can actually have influence and where we cannot accept any influence under the state law. Um, and then also uh, just to recognize all the work that has gone into creating these objective development standards. And we, um, we're looking for a process that can really let those work and let them function as the way, in the way they're intended to. So the proposed um, review, development review um, process makes no change to our community outreach policy, which requires notification and community meetings for projects based on their size. It makes no changing to the public hearing requirements for commercial development, for density bonus applications, for variance applications, development agreements, plan developments, all of those required public hearings um, at various levels and will continue to do so. Um, we are recommending making some changes to reflect the limitations under state law for housing development that we can't deny our condition of project to reduce its housing, it reduce intensity. We have to rely on objective standards for that review, and we can't have any le net loss of development capacity. So what we're re recommending is that for fully compliant proposals, so proposals that come in, they meet all of their zoning standards, they're compliant with the general plan, they meet every one of those um, objective standards for uh, design that we reviewed on June 2nd that apply to their project. A design permit would be required, but it would be reviewed administratively by the zoning administrator and would not trigger the need for a public hearing regardless of project size. So we would have done that community outreach event for a compliant project if it triggered that, you know, if it was five or more units. Um, and we by, by requiring this design permit, we create the right of appeal 
So, um, you know, any, con any interested concerned parties, they, they will still have the right to appeal that permit. Um, and they, and then also by, by being a discretionary action, um, these projects are projects under CEQA, so they would be subject to an initial study. So that's what we're proposing for projects that fully comply, that they go through a relatively streamlined discretionary process to you know, move through and get their permits and not be subject to the need for a public hearing unless there's an appeal that comes in. <clears throat> also, because we have just adopted these um, objective design standards, we haven't used them yet. Um, we're not sure how they're gonna hit the ground, what kind of issues might come up with development proposals. We felt the need to create some kind of process to allow a project applicant at their discretion to apply for a discretionary review. If they want to very propose an alternative design for um, any, of the, any of those standards. So we're limiting the scope of this alternative process to only um, departing from the standards that are in that section of 2412-185, which is the objective um, design standards for multifamily and mixed use housing that you reviewed on the second. So for those projects, a design permit would be required, but it would trigger a public hearing. As soon as you're varying from one of those, you're gonna trigger the need for a public hearing. Um, and uh, we're recommending that we accept review alternative designs for up to five of those standards at the ZA level. And as soon as it's six or more of those standards that we kick those, those public hearings up to the planning commission and let your commission really think about all the ways that um, a project might be wanting to vary or propose an alternative way of method of compliance with a design standard. <clears throat> so at those public hearings, there would be findings that would have to be made so again, we'd be making that very first design permit finding, which is essentially that the project is consistent with the general plan, with the municipal code, with all these standards uh, that we have around land use development. Um, but then also um, the public hearing body would need to make the finding that the alternative design achieves the goal established for the standard from which they are seeking to vary. So um, for example, roof forms are the design standards that we've reviewed that your commission discussed on the second require a variation in roof form for every 30, one variation for every 30 feet of building frontage. So we could have a situation where based on the length of the building, the building is supposed to have four varying roof forms. And for one reason or another, the developer really wants to provide three alternative roof forms instead of four or two, something like that. Um, the planning commissioner, the ZA would, would need to look at that alternative design and see if it still meets this goal that's established for the variation in roof form, which is to ensure that the tops of buildings are designed with architectural interest and to reduce bulk of buildings as they meet the sky. So, um, that hearing body would use their discretion and determine if they could make that finding based on the alternative design as presented. Um, and then we're also proposing that, you know, following that hearing after a permit is design permit is issued, if a developer comes in with any modification to that would it, that would add more standards, so vary from a standard that wasn't previously considered at a public hearing, that it would trigger the need for a new hearing. We really just want to encourage all of the alternatives to get out on the table all at once so that we can really look at the design holistically and determine if you can actually make the findings for each of the standards for which um, they're seeking to use an alternative design. So I do also want to talk about the density bonus. So as I mentioned, density bonuses, um, you know, will still trigger a public hearing. They are still going to be allowed, right? So a density bonus can allow, um, a developer, a development proponent to um, request waivers to standards that physically prevent development of the number of units that they're entitled to under that um, density bonus, under the amount of bonus that they're seeking. Um, so typically the standards that, that folks seek to waive with that are parking, height, FAR, and setbacks. Typically things about design materials, articulation, um, don't come up as much in terms of waivers. There are um, concessions that can be used. Those are limited um, for each project. So 
no more than four concessions are allowed and they have to be related to the financial feasibility of the project. So that could include things like materials, things like windows, um, uh, you know, things like that, but there's a limited number that they are qualified for and um, a hundred percent affordable project only gets four of those concessions. So that was one of the reasons that we felt like it was important to really um, fully articulate our design vision as we have more of those standards, more of those standards will apply even to density bonus projects. Okay, so inclusionary ADUs and replacement housing standards. Um, so the proposal is that um, ADUs not be able to be used as inclusionary units for a primary residential unit use. So currently in the code, there's a provision that allows um, the city council to <clears throat> identify ADUs to be used to meet the inclusionary requirement of a development proposal. I think primarily this has been used in the past when with subdivisions, when subdivisions triggered the need for um, including inclusionary units that sometimes the city council would want to identify a, a single family home and the ADU attached to it to meet that um, inclusionary requirement. This has been an implementation problem as those single family homes change hands over time. And then new owners aren't really aware of all the requirements that go along with that. And then they want to lift the inclusionary, they want to lift the deed restriction on the ADU. And um, it's, it hasn't functioned very well for us um, at the city. And um, also we don't really think it makes sense. You know, the, the point of the inclusionary requirement is to <laughs> create units that are equivalent to um, the market rate units. So we're removing that, we're recommending that we re delete that allowance to the city council and say that ADUs can't be used to meet the inclusionary requirement for the primary um, residential use, either as single family homes or as multifamily homes. And um, because ADUs are now allowed on multifamily properties, we are in a situation where we haven't been before and, and um, we could have five or more ADUs on a single property. And so um, what we're recommending is that we create an inclusionary requirement for those units. So when they're, as soon as you get to that fifth ADU, one of those ADUs now has to be an inclusionary unit and they become subject to the same um, standards for compliance. So ideally inclusionary ADUs are ADUs, the inclusionary requirement for ADUs is met by creating inclusionary ADUs, deed restricted affordable housing ADUs. Um, the inclusionary requirement for the larger multifamily project is met through those units um, and, they're, and they're separately, um, they're required separately on the same parcel. So that's what we're proposing. Um, for replacement housing, um, this is another area where state law has recently come in and made a lot of new requirements for us. And um, we know that our, our whole ordinance needs like a full scale update. But um, at this point, what we want to do is simply add some text to alert readers of the code that there are these requirements that come out of state law. There are places where our code is more strict and we would want to continue to apply those. There are places where state law is more strict and we're obligated to apply that. We have a whole interpretation document that's available on our website. It's multiple pages, so I won't try to explain where all those places are. Um, so what we're recommending is simply that we add text to the code that calls out that, um, you know, this code section applies and there may also be standards that come out of the, um, the state law that would also apply to demolition of residential units um, and the requirements for replacement housing. Okay, and then lastly, we've got two, two new definitions, or sorry, one amended definition and one new definition that we're proposing to add to the code. So we're proposing to amend the definition of usable open space so that it um, identifies that the area that's underneath a tree canopy, an existing tree canopy, counts double towards required open space. We're hoping that this can provide some flexibility and encourage developers to maintain those trees in place on site. <clears throat> That's the goal. And then we are also adding a definition for volumetric modular housing, which is um, sort of a newer building technology that involves um, 
essentially like Lego bricks of housing that are factory built modules come to site, they get joined together. The factories are state regulated and state inspected. And then one, and then on site, the construction and installation is done um, relative to the building codes, building standards codes. Um, and so we're proposing a definition where 50% or more of a structure consists of these modules. It's classified as that type of development. Um, and that all, that entitles those developments to a little bit more height, no, no additional stories, but a little bit more height um, in, in the mixed use zones and in the CC zone. So now we'll just wrap up with our next step. So after tonight's hearing, assuming we can you know, get, get through tonight and get some kind of recommendation going out to our um, city council. We'll be bringing together all of the pieces of the objective standards, the stuff we talked about on the second, the stuff we're talking about tonight. We'll be adding into the um, proposed ordinance amendments, everything that Public Works took to the Transportation Public Works Commission, everything that Parks took to their Parks and Rec Commission. We'll be adding in a small amendment to our um, water efficient landscaping ordinance to recognize the um, provision for living walls that has been added in these objective design standards. And then also your commission is going to be hearing a cleanup zoning item uh, later in July, and we will be grabbing that ordinance as well and bringing it all together so that we're sure um, putting it all together into one big ordinance to go to council so that we're not getting crossed up with each other and accidentally deleting things. So we're going to just take everything together in one big package. Um, we're targeting the city council hearing on August 23rd for that for a first reading, which would put give us a second reading um, later in September and then get us to implementation by October. And um, outside the coastal zone, we also need to submit to the Coastal Commission the portions of this package that are um, coastal implementing ordinances, which is several of them. <clears throat> several components of this package will need to be reviewed by the Coastal Commission. So um, we'll be submitting that to, to the Coastal Commission um, also in October after sometime after the second reading in September. So all of that, our staff recommendation is that your commission pass a motion to recommend that the City Council approve the proposed amendments to the City of Santa Cruz Municipal Code as presented tonight and make the required findings for the recommended rezonings and find that the pro proposed ordinance and zoning map amendments are consistent with the EIR previously adopted for the 2030 general plan. And with that, I will take any questions from the commission. Okay, thank you so much for that report. Um, we'll go ahead and go to clarifying questions from commissioners now. Commissioner Schifrin, go ahead. Thank you. Um, first, I wanna thank uh, Thank you, Sarah and staff, for all the work that went into this. Um, it's uh, quite impressive. There's a lot of thought and complexity that you had to deal with. Uh, and you know, I appreciate the work that occurred. Um, I have some questions about um, some of the implications of the recommendations. Um, as you know, there's a proposal for 390 unit development at 908 Ocean Street. And what I'm wondering is, is that within the mixed use medium or the mixed use high proposed district? So that, it, neither, it's on Ocean Street, right? So that's in one of those mixed use, so mixed use ocean medium or ocean high. It's in, it yeah. covers both. Right, so it actually straddles the line, and so in re when they've as they've been reviewing that project because it's like already quite in the pipeline. They're like getting an EIR done. They're going out for a, hiring a consultant to do the EIR now. So different portions of that site are subject to different um, FAR standards. So um, the review of that project has been a little bit complicated because of that. Okay. Under the proposed, uh, assuming that that project doesn't request a density dump bonus, doesn't request uh, a plan development, doesn't request a variance, mm -hmm. under the proposed um, um, site review, and they don't uh, propose any variance from the objective standards, 
would this project be approvable by right? So it's not by right. So so the, so there's two things here. So first of all, that project's already in the pipeline. So like our objective. Well, I'm talking standard. about a project that size. Sure. Yeah. Because so let's so let's let's pretend that project goes away and then exactly the same project comes back next year. Okay. So it's not by right. It does require this discretionary design permit. Um which is a discretionary action, it's administrative. And like, it, so it's a little bit of this gray area, right? Like we, we don't really have any, a lot of discretion that we can exercise under the state law. And yet we're setting up this administrative procedure. It's not a ministerial action, right? It's not just- But there would be no public hearing. The public there, wouldn't, would have- there, would not, there would not need to be a public hearing, right? So there, there would be public notification through our community outreach policy there would be a community meeting through our community outreach policy. And then staff would review that application. And if it conforms to all of the standards, we would grant the design permit, which creates a right of appeal, triggers CEQA, all that stuff. CEQA review, you know, initial study. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I wanted to, I appreciate the extensive response you gave to the public correspondence regarding the request that the commission reduce the density in these mixed use, high density mixed use areas. Um, I, I wanna try to cut to the chase because I, I kind of got lost through all the explanation. I'm afraid that some of the members of the public might have as well. Mm-hmm. But my understanding is the commission and the city council cannot change, cannot approve zoning that is inconsistent with the general plan. But the gen- or if it does, it doesn't matter because the general plan is going to uh, prevail. So the what is being proposed is conforming the zoning ordinance to the general plan uh, because we have to, uh, in a sense, and we can get right down to it because we are legally required to implement uh, um, regulations at the general plan density. So it makes no sense to have a zoning ordinance uh, density that's different from that because it just sends a, uh, an incorrect message to the public. I just think it's very important to just make it very clear that legally we can't do what we're being requested to do. Um, and I think that I just want to confirm that my understanding is is correct. No matter how sympathetic we may be to wanting to do what's being requested, it's not something that is within our jurisdiction or authority under current state law. Is that true? Yes, that's correct. That's a very succinct summary. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I... Um, had a concern about the usable open space definition, not because I potentially disagreed with it, but I know there was some, we had a good deal of discussion about usable open space and how much of it could be communal, how much of it would community, how much of it would be private. And um, I'm just, I just wonder what the potential impact of this definition is. If there's a big tree at one corner of the property that shades a whole, you know, a quarter of the property, would that essentially make, you know, private open space impossible? So there'd be this open space that would be left, that would be there, whether it's usable open space or not, because um, the development would be prohibited from cutting down the tree because it was not necessary to the development. So I'm, I'm not, I guess I need more understanding about how this really would be an incentive um, for developers since, um, you know, if, if a tree's in the middle of the site, it's gonna need to get cut down for the, for the development to occur. If it's at the edge of the site, it's not gonna be possible for it to be cut down one way or the other because we wanna protect our heritage trees. Mm-hmm. So I'm not, you know, are we, simply reducing private open space or uh, community open space by doing this um, when we're really not providing much of 
an incentive to um, protect heritage trees because there's already the incentive to protect them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's you see a, my concern. Sure. Yeah, no, I do. Um, I think that that it's a good question. Um, I so I guess so. So let let me think about this. Would it cut down on the amount of total open space provided on the site? Yes, it would. It would cut down on that on that total amount of open space required with the intent then being that that flexibility that's provided to the development will allow them to accommodate a tree rather than cutting it down. Um, in the mixed use zones and the commercial zones, the total amount of required um, open space I think can be met pretty easily. And this, um, I, I don't see, I guess, I see your concern that, um, you know, the, that this may not be too much of a, an incentive because of, um, you know, the way that development happens. I don't share that concern on the mixed use, in the mixed use zones and the commercial zones because um, of the amount of open space that's required because it's only 80 square feet of, co of communal per unit and 40 square feet of private. And the way that we've tuned the incentives in um, part one that came on, on, on June 2nd is that there's no limit on the total amount of open space that can be dedicated to, the, to private open space. So private open space now has the preference over communal open space. That is a change from the current condition, which preferences communal open space over private open space. That's based on feedback we got from existing renters, blah, 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 all that stuff. So. Um, I do see the place where I could see this sort of not really working for a site is a place that's really, really covered with trees right now and where and where it's zoned for the RL or the RM where we are not making any change to that total amount of required open space. Um, and the open space requirement in those zone districts is quite high. So in those places, I could see that, you know, it may not work as well as we would hope it would. Um, just based on the total amount of open space that would still be required and you'd still be kind of like pushing on this building. So counting, you know, just the, this, you know, 200 circular square feet as 400 might not be enough to really make the building footprint more flexible. But those same, you know, 200 to 400 on a site where the total amount of open space required is less, I think it can create that flexibility and create more opportunities to preserve these trees. I mean, we could have trees that are in a courtyard, right? So we could be pushing the buildings outward. We don't have any front setbacks or any side setbacks on these mixed use sites or commercial sites, right? So you could have a situation where you have a courtyard with a tree that can stay in place in front of the building. So um, I see your concern, um, but I think in most cases, this will at least provide some flexibility um, you know, I, whether, it, whether it's going to get all the way there, I think we'll have to wait and see. I think that's true of a lot of these design standards. You know, we have this intention, we've set these goals, we've done our best work that we can, and we're going to have to kind of see how they hit the ground with development review over the next year or two years or so. I guess I hear what you're saying, but I think, you know, as it could work positively, it could work negatively in terms of, you know, limiting, um, private open space, but, um, you know, I, I think it is unclear. It could work either way. So, okay, I don't, those are my questions for now. I have uh, substantive concerns, um, but I'll wait until after the uh, public gets to speak before um, reviewing those. But thank you again for thank this you. effort. Thank you. Any commissioners with any clarifying questions for staff before we go to public comment? Okay, seeing none, uh, members of the public, uh, now is the time if you would like to speak on the objective standards to raise your hand uh, using the raise hand function if you're on Zoom and if you're on the phone, please go ahead and press star nine. And we'll call on you and you will have three minutes once you are called upon. Um, you will hear the clerk say time. And once you hear that, please wrap up your comments. 
Okay, going to public comment, clerk, will you please uh, call on the first speaker, please? Uh, please identify yourself if, you're li if you would like, and you will have three minutes. Speaker, you're on the line. Hello? Yes, we Hello? can hear you, go ahead. Okay, um, my name is Candace Brown. I live on the east side, uh, East Morrissey, um, and resident for 47 years. Um, I'm also on the Transportation and Public Works Commission, and I've been following, as many know, very closely the corridors from the very first meetings, community meetings, and in going into the corridor advisory committee uh, meetings that went on for 18 months. Um, so basically, um, I have a couple of key comments. One, in the general plan, there's only two things, my understanding, that are specified. And frankly, I don't think many people understood what that really meant. One was 2.75 FAR, which is the floor area ratio, and the other is 55 units per acre. Um, and previously, it was 30 units per acre. Um, I should also note that they were supposed to put in a high density bonus of 40, but I think it was forgotten in the original general plan um, and was perhaps added later as part of the um, density bonus laws. But anyway, so with that being said, with 2.75 FAR, I don't understand why uh, MUVH is four stories with 50 feet um, height, whereas uh, MU H is five stories of 55 units. I know they were considering higher height and stories um, along Soquel and Water, but that was before um, they were considering the implications of height and density bonus and state mandates. And so, uh, if anything, it should go down because the base unit then, you know, would, would provide some constraint, if you will, because they can still go beyond that with the density bonus and with the waivers and concessions. So um, my initial comment is why not go with uh, MUVH for the, um, the height and the uh, four stories? Because um, you've already shown that 2.75 could be done within that footprint. I should also mention that it was very clear during the advisory committee meetings, which were not unfortunately considered in this exercise for some reason, um, but there is documentation that was uh, part of the consultants. And um, it was very clear that a transit-oriented environment on Soquel and water was really not feasible. Uh, if you wanted to set up um, bus rapid transit, you would have to take out all the parking along Soquel alone would be 300 parking spaces. That would be the uh, parking area of four Whole Food parking lots, which doesn't exist. And also you would have to set back the buildings, which were estimated by the Eberts family to be at least 40 to 50 buildings on Soquel alone to entertain the idea of a truly transit-oriented environment. So it's always been said to me to consider that they talk about that in that context when it's really not the case. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Clerk, please uh, call the next speaker. Okay, speaker, you're on the line. I'm calling in to ask the Planning Commission to make a requirement of 25% affordable units before the density bonus. That's what we need is affordable units, especially on Water Street and SoCal. Um, if the Planning Commission requests the staff and City Council to work on securing state and federal and private funds to build 100% affordable, then we aren't going to be hit with this density bonus that's causing a hype to get so high, way over five stories. Um, what we need to do, we've got so much research by notable scholars telling us about building additional market rates. When we need the affordable is going to hurt our community because that will make the people that are the low income sit down to the very low income and that is the arena numbers that we never met and we can't do that we need people to be able to live in these units that are the section eight and the people that are low income we can't make it go it's very important we have to consider the consequences of what we're doing and how we need 
you guys, the planning commission, the city council listens to you. When you guys vote on something, they don't even talk about the particulars that went on. They just go by what you vote. And when you make a comment and really let them know what it's important for them to do, they can direct staff. And we really need that. We need the wisdom in our community. Thank you for all your work. And the modular ideas are really good that Sarah came up with. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, we'll go ahead and go to the next caller. Caller, please identify yourself if you'd like, and you have three minutes. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, my name is Jim Burns, and I live on the east side. Um, I realize that compromise is a mostly negative word in government these days, but it seems pretty obvious that this process could ideally result in standards that allow us to accommodate reasonable growth, something many of us, including me, continue to strongly support, but it could also ideally be done in a manner that is respectful of the interest and rights of all citizens. It's in that spirit of compromise that I ask you as our planning commissioners to take your citizens' concerns to heart and direct staff to reduce the impacts of tall developments that would be placed immediately adjacent to existing residences. More precisely, I believe it is inappropriate to locate MUH zoning, at least as your planner defines it, immediately adjacent to existing R1 zoning. And it certainly appears that the proposed zoning maps, particularly along Water Street and Soquel Avenue, show MUH zoning concentrated immediately adjacent to those existing residential properties. Interestingly, unlike the proposed zoning on Mission Street. In fact, if you're so inclined to have MUH zoning and to satisfy the transportation goal that um, Ms. News mentioned, I think it was one of the four that she referenced early in her presentation, why on earth not have the higher density, density zoning located closer to UCSC and, the, and, and bus routes? Where the, and, and that's where the demand for those units is most acute. Placing it once again on the east side seems truly at odds with good planning. But really, I think it makes more sense to direct staff to rezone proposed MUH parcels to MU, MUM, sorry, wherever these parcels adjoin existing R1 zoning. Or if this is more doable, to simply reduce the maximum height permitted for the MUH parcels to something that is more respectful of affected neighbors. Four stories is plenty high for a building located immediately adjacent to an R1 home. Thank you, commissioners, for your time tonight and very much for your service. Thank you for your comments. Uh, we'll go ahead and go to the next speaker. Uh, identify yourself if you'd like, and you will have three minutes. Thank you very much for the time. Uh, this is Ryan Meckel, a member of Santa Cruz EMB. I uh, just wanted to call in in support of this uh, and recommend that you accept the staff rec staff's recommendation. Uh, I like all the work that went into this, um, and I think that the plan lays out a very good plan for some the growth that Santa Cruz needs to house all of its residents. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, give just one more second. Uh, this is the last call for. Any members of the public who would like to speak on the objective standards, uh, if you are on the Zoom, you can raise your hand by using the raise hand feature. If you're on the phone, you can go ahead and press star nine, and I'll just wait for a second for the lag. Um, okay, I'm not seeing any additional speakers. Clerk, could you please confirm? That is correct. There are no additional speakers. Okay, thank you so much. With that, I'll go ahead and uh, close public comments and bring it back to the commission for discussion and action. Uh, Commissioner Ms. C.D. Miller, and then um, I see staff has their hand up as well. So we'll go ahead and go to Commissioner Ms. C.D. Miller, and then we'll go to Mr. Benoit. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Dawson. Uh, I, I just wanted to thank staff, uh, unbelievably, excellent work on the objective standards um, operating within some very difficult constraints handed down to us by the state and a general plan that was passed some 10 years ago. It is really great to see the zoning code being finally brought into compliance with the general plan. 
Um, and having said all of that, I'm prepared to move the staff's recommendation. Thank you. I'll, I'll second. You're muted, Cindy. Sorry. <laughs> we have a, a motion to move the staff recommendation uh, by Commissioner Mercedes Miller, a second by Commissioner Conway. So that motion is on the floor. We'll um, have additional discussion. Uh, Mr. Van Waugh, did you want to add in something before we go to the additional discussion of the motion? Yes, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to note to the commissioners, given the even numbers of commissioners today, uh, per the commission bylaws, uh, just in case there is a tie vote on a motion, that motion would be continued to a future meeting. And, and so if there's multiple motions, uh, any, any tie vote on a motion would, go, would be continued, but the whole item doesn't have to be either if, if there are multiple motions. So I did just want to make that aware to, to all the commissioners. Uh, and if, if there is a tie vote and there is a continuance, uh, we can talk later about the possible dates for that continuance. But I just wanted to make the, the commission aware of that now. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Renoir. Um, so uh, Commissioner Kennedy and then Commissioner Schifrin. Uh, I too am extremely excited to have the zoning code coming in compliance with the general plan. Kind of sad none of the architects are still here to see it, but what a great accomplishment and I appreciate the staff's work. Um, I appreciate how fast we are going on this. That's wonderful. Um, one of my favorite things is that three tiered approach. I felt like that really hit the you know, some projects can go straight through, but these ones need a little bit more review and these need even more. So I appreciate the clarity provided there. Um, it's a small thing, but the cell, cell tower thing, love seeing that go through. We've had a lot of hearings on cell towers in the past, so that's great. Um, these are just kind of my comments. I think that modular housing thing is really important. I see that on my projects. I, as I understand, there's a cost to union framing by doing this, but we have to build housing fast and that's a big, big deal. So I have one of these projects and, you know, the floors just are taller. So that's absolutely true and just critical for these projects to go up fast. Um, I just want to verify that and appreciate that that's right out front. Um, I really liked the active uses that, that part, Sarah, where it was changing to encouraged, I think that's delightful. I do think about residential on the ground floor more in some commercial zones, you know, with respect for jobs and our 50s dream of uh, toy shops with glass windows and things like that. But I think, I think it's good to play around with those things a little bit. Um, I do have one kind of specific question about Mission Street. And Sarah, I wonder if you could show that that map of those parcels that are going to be rezoned. Let me pull that up. I should know it by heart. Doot, doot, doot. Can you put that on the screen by any chance? Is yeah, that, that, that. Yep. Uh, so I have a quick question. This is a my house question. I live <laughs> right there, right there on Miramar Drive between King and Mission. And despite what some people think, I love the idea of housing on the west side. Thank you very much. So hardly ever, Sarah, do we have that um, parallel street, you know, one block in from a corridor. Here. But I just wonder if they ever think about grabbing those three next lots there um, to make a bigger, more developable parcel. Again, there's like hardly anywhere this happens on any of the corridors. But I just thought I would ask that question. Now's my chance. So um, the direction we have from the city council at this point in time is to reconcile the existing mismatch between the general plan and the zoning ordinance without amending the general plan. Um, so that is not recommended at this time. Got it. And that would require a general plan. It, right. So thank you. Yes. <laughs> That's super clear. I should have caught that before. Um, good. Yeah, I really like this. I, I would be happy to vote for it right now. 
I love the idea also that we're going to play with some things and how you describe that about, you know, going out, seeing how it goes and coming back because that's the reality we live in around here. Um, thanks again. This is an exciting moment for me. I'm ready to vote yes. Okay, thank you. Um, um, go ahead, Commissioner Schifrin. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I had only, I had very little concern about the substance. Um, I have two substantive suggestions, but my, um, I have a, I have a couple of process concerns. Um, I think it's really important whether the, the city has a great deal of discretion or not, that the public get to be able to state their views and um, participate in the process. And I'm concerned about um, the hearing body and procedures where if a project, no matter how large it is, um, has no variations from the objective standards, it's essentially approved at the staff level. And I just don't think that that's a uh, good public process. And so my sense is, uh, and what I would like to see, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna run through the uh, changes uh, I'm going to recommend in motions, but I'll do them individually, but I wanna cover, you know, let you know what I'm concerned about. Um, for that in section 2412185, -185, I would say there would, should be no design public hearings for projects proposing no variations from objective standards only for projects of 25 units or less. So larger projects, they should have ZA hearings and a ZA hearing for a project from 25 to 50 units and no more than five variations. And then if a project's over 50 units, um, and for all five variations, <clears throat> it should be a public hearing at the Planning Commission. I just think that for larger projects, the public should be able to weigh in on the design permits, even though the discretion is limited. Although, as um, staff has indicated, it's limited, but to the extent that particularly if the developer or the applicant wants to vary something, um, does it meet the goal? Doesn't it meet the goal? I think those are, um, are issues that shouldn't just be made alone by the ZA or by the Planning Commission without um, uh, public input. So I think for larger projects, there needs to be uh, the ability for the public to have, um, to be able to participate in the hearings, um, any larger project. And then in terms of zoning districts, it seems to me kind of contradictory, and maybe I'm not understanding it correctly, that for a PD or for a variance, there's a requirement, or for a density bonus project, there's a requirement for a public hearing. But for a mixed use project um, of no matter what size, or a housing project of no matter what size, in a whole host of, um, of districts, the proposal is that it be um, it, it, the the project could be approved by right, and with just a design permit being um, considered, <clears throat> I think the public has the right to have more than just a design permit hearing. That it has a right to participate and express its views on uh, other issues as well related to the project. So from my perspective, uh, I would support uh, uh, by right for mixed use and housing projects um, for de developments from three to 25 units, but require a special use permit for uh, developments over 50 units. Um, I could see raising that threshold, but to just have any size project like a 390 unit project potentially that would only need a design permit, I think is not reasonable. Um, so those are my process concerns that I'll, uh, my intention is to make a motion to amend the, um, the motion on the floor to make these ch the changes I suggested. I'm also concerned as our uh, members, as were members of the public about the heights. Um, and my concern, um, I think there's nothing we can really do about, or and I, I don't know whether 
uh, how many commissioners would want to do anything about changing the heights under what's allowed under the general plan. But the reality is those heights are not the real heights because density bonuses could allow those heights to increase. So what I would recommend, and I sort of got this from the staff recommendation when we were considering uh, the downtown expansion, that there be a site development standards that uh, that would be added to the zones for uh, the, the districts where the heights exceed 40 feet, that um, the height be inclusive of any density bonus. And that, the dens that that would be the height, and that would be inclusive of the density bonus. And that would be a site development standard in those various districts. And finally, um, to follow up on what one of the speakers said, and an issue that uh, has been brought forward by members of the commission in the past, under the inclusionary requirements uh, in section 2416.020, I would like to add the following at the end of the paragraph, which would be projects with a 30% density bonus uh, shall have a 25% inclusionary requirement. Projects with a 50% density bonus shall have a 30% inclusionary requirement. I think we need to increase the inclusionary requirement as projects come forward that get more units than um, would be um, normally allowed under the general plan and the, zone, and the proposed zoning ordinance. And I think it will also help us meet our, uh, our arena targets for low and very low units. So having said all that, I'm going to make a motion. I'm not going to do it all in one motion. I'm going to make a motion uh, to amend the motion on the floor um, that under 24, section 2412.185, there should be no design, that the language be changed, that there be no design permit public hearings for projects proposing uh, no variation from the objective standards, only for projects of 25 units or less, and a CA hearing for projects from 26 to 50 units and no more than five variations, and a planning commission hearing uh, if over 50 units or more than five variations. So that would be my motion to amend. Um, okay, do we have, do you have a second for that motion? I'll second that. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor to amend the main motion. Uh, let's go to the maker of the motion first, the main motion on the floor. Do you accept that as a, a, a friendly amendment to your main motion? Commissioner Masidi Miller, or do we need to vote on this separately? I would need to vote on that separately. I don't accept it as friendly amendment. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to get that process out of the way. Uh, let's go to staff, and then we'll go to Commissioner Conway. Um, and any more discussion before we vote on this amendment? Go ahead, Ms. Noisy. Hey, yes, thank you. Um, so I have. Um, I don't have a direct concern with the motion that was just made. I do have a concern about. Um, the idea to add a clause about the heights, including the density bonus. The heights that are recommended do not currently include a density bonus. They include the bare minimum that is required to comply with the general plan. So a lot more height would have to be added before we could set that kind of standard and claim that we were allowing full development um, under the general plan and under any density bonus application that might come in. The heights would have to be a lot taller and I don't know what they would have to be right now. Okay, well- Well, that's not the motion on the floor, so. Yeah, let's, let's, let's hold that discussion when we get to that motion. So the motion on the floor um, is, is regarding review. Um, and let's go to Commissioner Conway um, and then we'll also have the clerk read back the motion um, before we vote and certainly if we need to to inform our further discussion go ahead commissioner conway okay <clears throat> taking these one by one um first of all i also want to chime in and thank staff for um a really uh amazing job it was a really big job um there was a very comprehensive um approach at being balanced and i really appreciate that um, I also do appreciate Commissioner Schifrin's earlier clarification on what we're really limited to tonight. Um, I share Commissioner Schifrin's concern about public participation. Um, and I disagree with this motion, though, 
um, pretty strongly because I think it's deceptive to the pub public, which is not what I think the intent was at all. Um, as I understand the process as proposed, um, there already will be an opportunity for the community to um, chew over the project, weigh in on concerns and pass them along. So there, but to suggest that adding a public hearing um, requirement when it's kind of a fiction, um, you know, it doesn't add anything in terms of actual discretion. And I think it ends up being misleading and therefore divisive um, in the community. Um, and I, what I feel like, I think as the staff was trying to say that it really makes um, the most sense, um, at least, you know, starting out to um, include the um, community at, um, as it's proposed um, and not create a false expectation of discretion where none exists. That's my feeling on it. Okay. Thank, thank you, Commissioner Conway. Uh, we'll go ahead and go back to Commissioner Schifrin and then any additional comments, and then we'll go ahead and vote on this amendment to the main motion. Go ahead, Commissioner Schifrin. I want to respond to that. The staff is exercising discretion when they decide whether an objective standard has been met or not. Um, for those of us who's, who uh, read the the voluminous staff report on the 831 Water Street project uh, and the review of the variety of standards. Um, there is some question about whether a standard is met or not. Um, there can be a question about whether all the objective standards in the project are being met. The, what the proposal does is essentially make those decisions simply staff decisions. And I think that that's one, I don't think it's deceptive for allowing the public to come in and say, well, wait a minute, you're saying that um, all the objective standards are being met, but what about this standard here in terms of setback from the street? Staff is not infallible. Um, there, and there can be differences of opinion about whether a particular standard uh, has been met, whether it's objective or not, or whether all the objective standards have been met or not. And by excluding the public from being able even to uh, um, do anything more than appeal, if they can even find out when it's happened and what's happened, I think that really undermines this idea that we really care about public participation. Because um, what we, from my perspective, to really care about public participation is to try to maximize the opportunities for the public to weigh in and respond. People um, uh, may not like what they hear, but you know they are able to understand the, um, the requirements. And some of them, many of them are able to provide meaningful input that could be helpful to staff. Um, one final thing, I've gone to a few community meetings. I've heard from a number of community representatives that community meetings are meaningless um, because the developer hears from what, pe what people have to say and then does, does what he or she just wants to do. So, you know, the, the community meetings have no uh, legal status. Um, they can be helpful if there's a, a sensitive developer or they can be ignored. Um, it's when the decisions are being made on the project that I think public input is critical. So I would, you know, I would argue that it's not meaningless, it's not misleading um, to allow for the public to have meaningful input in the hearing procedure. Thank you, Commissioner Schifrin. Uh, Commissioner Kennedy, I'm just going to jump in and make a couple brief comments and then we'll go directly to you. Um, so uh, I, I think that, you know, the amendment on the floor actually, you know, does balance um, this need for public participation. Um, I think the community meetings really serve, the, the main purpose of community meetings that I've heard from folks is, is in a lot of ways, it lets people know 
what's going on because a lot of people aren't tracking things on the planning commission website word does get out that there's this community meeting and then they go and learn about the project and then they they want to be able to talk about it and a lot of times it's it's the public's kind of first introduction to the project is these community meetings and so I think it's it, it's a really balanced approach uh, with the delineation of less than 25, 25 to 50, um, and 50 more, um, giving a, a place for the community to go to then bring forward their comments in, in a public space. Um, so I think you know the, the whole package uh, together with this amendment, the the requirements of the community meeting. Um, do do a real service to the community and and allow us to be inclusive. And so I, I'm definitely in support of, the, of this amendment. Um, we'll go ahead and go to Commissioner Kennedy, then back to Commissioner Conway. Well, I, I, I have seen projects where voluntary input, like at an early community outreach meeting, has really changed things, like but from the inside. So I just rebut that. I think that it does help. I think it's good, like Cindy's saying, to get the word out and get the NIMBYs organized and get the thing rolling, you know. So that's not really under discussion. That's the, the public outreach policy, which would remain. And then, Andy, I just disagree about small projects being subjected to that extra process i hear where you're coming from and i like transparency too but i've seen very long public processes with a lot of public input really get nowhere and actually be worse from all that and at least for me the quarter plan was one of those so um, with respect for your opinion i just wanted to express that as well thank you commissioner kennedy commissioner conway and I just wanted to emphasize um, my support of public participation also. Um, and I think that our community participation policy is important. Um, and that that hearing or that, that meeting will occur. It will let people know what's going on. The size of the project is not relevant. Um, the It's always important to have that community meeting and and again, I think we're just we're just uh, falsely letting people know that there's going to be a change. So it's already there. Um, what you're saying in terms of public participation, in my opinion. Okay, thank you. Um, I think uh, last call for any additional comments, and we'll go ahead and bring this amendment forward uh, for a vote. Um, are all the commissioners clear about what we're voting on here, or do we need the clerk to read it? We clear? Okay, clerk, can I, we have a roll call vote for the amendment from Commissioner Schifrin, please. Commissioner Conway? No. Kennedy? No. Maxwell? Aye. Uh, Masidi Miller? No. Schifrin? Aye. Chair Dawson? Aye. So that is a three to three vote, uh, which is a tie, which um, means that that it fails. Fails. <laughs> so I'd like to make a motion to amend the motion on the floor that for all districts proposed for uh, amendments where there would be approval by right for housing and mixed use projects. Um, that right uh, would be allowed for developments with from three to 25 units and a special use permit shall be required for all developments over 25 units. So that's my motion. Okay, do we have a second? Uh, second from Commissioner Maxwell. Uh, any discussion on this? Or, well, let me go back to the main motion, maker of the main motion. Do you accept that as a friendly amendment? I do not. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and have uh, any discussion we'd like to have and have a vote. Uh, Commissioner Schifrin and then Commissioner Conway. Well, I don't wanna repeat what we said previously. I do think that since there are public hearings required for plan developments, for variances for of any size, uh, for plan developments of any size, 
and for you know density bonus projects, I think you know it makes sense that the public has a right to have a um, uh, be, have a hearing that there be a public hearing for for larger projects uh, that are housing and mixed use. Okay, um, over to Commissioner Conway. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I may have misunderstood the point of this motion. So, but um, one of the things that I, I like about um, putting these standards in place um, as objective standards is um, I believe there's a lot of incentive for developers to stick with the standards. Um, so in other words, um, to, to not vary. Um, and, uh, and so for that reason, I think making this as streamlined as possible is part of getting what I think we're asking for, you're, you're proposing in this motion, um, which is, you know, we're saying this is okay. We want this to be okay, but if we're going to go to something that's really different from that, you know, like a density bonus, it should have a public hearing, which it does. So um, I don't feel like adding that extra complexity here. Um, that I think that's working against our um, desire to have understandable standards. Um, so I don't think this is actually even meeting what I think the point is at least as, as I understand it, could be wrong. Okay, any other comments before we bring this uh, amendment to a vote? Okay, uh, let's go ahead and have a roll call vote on the amendment from Commissioner Schifrin. Commissioner Conway? No. Kennedy? No. Maxwell? Aye. C.D. Miller? No. Schifrin? Aye. Chair Dawson? Aye. Uh, another tie, so that motion fails. So I, and we I have another motion having to do with the height uh, regulations. And I, I guess I would like to follow up on what uh, Steph was saying about needing to increase the height. Um, I don't understand why that is the case. Um, we're talking about when we were uh, considering the height in the um, downtown expansion area that, as I understood it, staff was saying that the height limits would be inclusive of the density bonuses and they would, um, you know, there would probably be a requirement for development agreement built in. Well, I don't see why that can't apply in these other districts as well. So uh, I guess before I make my motion, I'd like to hear uh, Steph's response. Uh, sure. So happy to discuss that. So um, what we're proposing in the with the downtown plan expansion, and for members of the public that may not be familiar with that project, um, the city's proposing or studying at this point, getting ready to do an EIR to expand the boundaries of our downtown plan and create a lot more housing intensity south of Laurel Street. So the current proposal, the motion that passed from city council was for maximum heights up to 175 feet. So the way that we would achieve that as staff to have 175 feet be the maximum that we could get to with the density bonus would be to set the base density in the plan somewhere lower than that. We have to still run those calculations. We have to like figure that all out. We would probably base it on a 50% density bonus, not an 80% density bonus. We would have to try and do some um, tweaking on that so that the policies that we write in the downtown plan say without a density bonus and without a development agreement, you get this smaller amount of development so that then with a development agreement or with a density bonus, you're not exceeding that 175. So what I'm saying about these zone districts is that um, a 50% density bonus on a, you know, a 2.75 FAR is 
you know, an FAR of over four, right? If I can do that math correctly in my head, um, you know, ex- over three and a half. So we don't have heights that accommodate a three and a half FAR currently in the code. Um, we could figure that out, but they would be taller than 55 feet, right? So um, that's that's what I was saying is that 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 ex- that additional capacity isn't built in currently to the recommendation that's in front of the commission today. Matt, did you have something to add? Yeah, thanks. Just to clarify that further, the, that downtown expansion area was increasing the capacity so much that that density bonus could still be built in and it would still not be decreasing the amount of developable capacity and units on those sites, given the current general plan designations. Uh, what we're seeing in these other areas is that there's already a state required num- you know, amount of capacity per our current general plan. And that's, that's a required height essentially based on that FAR. And then the state density bonus is also a state requirement on top of that, on top of that requirement. So it can't be built in in this case because they're they're two separate state requirements. So what you're saying is that a 30% density bonus on height would allow 55 feet to increase by 30%, which well, would be the 15 feet. So not it's not always a one to one. So when they do a density bonus application is about bonus units. So whatever height is necessary to accommodate that number of bonus units is the amount of height that the developer requests through a waiver. And it's not always a 30% bonus is a 30% increase in height. The one we had one on front street, they did a 35% density bonus. They did a 16% increase in height. We had, um, you know, a 50% density bonus over on center street and they had, um, like a 110% increase in height. So it's not just a, it's not a one-to-one calculation. It depends on the geometry of the site. It depends on the existing site standards, depends on the densities. So not to say that that math can't be done. It can be done. We're going to do it for downtown, right? Because we're up zoning in that location. But in these areas where we are not currently up zoning, we would have to, it would be a whole different process because there's no additional capacity that we're, that we're proposing to add at this point in time. Okay, I think okay, I understand Mr. what you're saying. Um, so I'm gonna let that lie for now. Um, and I'll go to my last motion that for section 2416.020, um, the following be added at the end of the paragraph. Projects with a 30% density bonus shall have a 25% inclusionary requirement. Projects with a 50% density bonus shall have a 30% inclusionary requirement. Um, that would be my motion to amend the motion on the floor. Okay, do we have a second? That. Second from Maxwell. Uh, any comments from commissioners before we take this amendment to a vote? Oh, I guess I technically need back to go back to the uh, maker of the main motion again. Uh, Commissioner Mercedes Miller, do you accept that as a friendly amendment? Um, I'm not hearing you, but I'm seeing seeing a shake of the head. Okay, thank you. (laughs) All right. Um, So I would just like to make a quick comment before we go back to Commissioner Schifrin. Um, You know, we, we, we keep bringing this up because all this does, I just want to be really clear, is make it congruent with the city's existing 20% inclusionary. It's, you know, we've been handed the state law that changes the math and we're making an adjustment so we get what the city has said and the council has said should be the standard in the city, which is what 20% based on, you know, all the units in the development. So, um, you know, we talk about being for inclusionary and for affordable housing and, you know, we have the opportunity to actually put our money where our mouth is. And I, I'm just really hopeful that, that we can do that. Um, Commissioner uh, Conway. Um, I agree that we need as much affordable housing um, as we can. 
Um, I do not believe this is consistent with state law or that it's going to help. It, 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 it's not the right way to do it because it's not going to succeed. Um, I do think that we should work as hard as we can um, using the tools that are before us. This just isn't one of the tools that is before us. So I will be voting no on this also. Okay, uh, back to Commissioner Schifrin, and then uh, if there isn't any more comments, we'll go to a vote. Let me just say, when we had the discussion at the commission about the 20% inclusionary requirement, um, we were told it was opposed on the basis that it wasn't realistic, it wasn't the right way to do it, and it's proved to be quite effective, I think, and accepted. As we saw at a recent meeting on 555 Pacific, the developer, the property owner didn't come in and say, I can't meet the 20%, let me just have the 15%, which was what was required when my project was first approved. He's by, able, by using uh, Section 8 vouchers that go to the very low-income people, um, the 20% requirement is working. This requirement can work as well. And it's just, you know, to the extent that we're, you know, wanting to meet our uh, arena targets for uh, low and very low income housing, it's not going to be enough just to produce 100% affordable units. That's not going to be sufficient. Um, I think these, this is not an unreasonable um, change. Um, I think we've heard from staff before that it's not uh, illegal. It doesn't violate state law. Um, and so I think it's good public policy. And, you know, I think it is um, something that is worth moving forward with. Okay. Um I'll go ahead and bring this to a vote. Um, one last call for commissioners. Okay, um, clerk, could we please have a roll call vote on the amendment on the floor from Commissioner Schifrin? Commissioner Conway? No. Kennedy? No. Maxwell? Aye. Katie Miller? No. Schifrin? Aye. Chair Dawson? Aye. So once again, we have a 3-3, so that uh, amendment fails. So we are back to the main motion on the floor, which is from Commissioner Mercedes Miller um, with a second uh, to approve the staff recommendation. Um, we'll do any additional comments from commissioners now before we bring that main motion to a vote. Go ahead, Commissioner Schiff. Just very briefly, I'm not, uh, while I appreciate the work that staff has done and can support most of what is recommended, I think there are significant uh, problems that I have with some of the recommendations, and I'm not going to be able to support the motion. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Schifrin. Uh, Commissioner Kennedy. I'm ready to move this ahead. I just wanted to make one more quick comment. I'd forgotten about those concessions. So if the upgrade from PVC vinyl windows to anything else is too expensive, they could still use a couple of those to knock them out. That's the business we did last time. I'm ready to vote. Okay. Uh, so we have the main motion on the floor, which is to accept the staff recommendation. Could we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Conway? Aye. Kennedy? Aye. Maxwell? No. Ms. T.D. Miller? Aye. Different? No. Chair Dawson? No. So that is a 3-3, so um, staff can chime in here. But um, with that uh, tie for the main motion, that will be continued to a future meeting. Is that correct? Can staff just confirm that this item will now be continued? Uh, go, go ahead, uh, Commissioner Kennedy. This is pretty urgent. Could we do a special meeting as soon as possible to move this ahead? <laughs> uh, let's, let's hear from staff and uh, we'll talk about next step. I'll let Matt take it. Go ahead, Matt. Hold on. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, the next possible date we could do this would be a special meeting on the 14th of July. It's 
Sarah and I are both out on the, the 7th, uh, but the 14th was, is one possibility to do a special meeting then. Uh, there are- I think you need items. to check to see when our mission com missing commissioner is gonna be back. Um, she may not be back till the 18th. Um, I, I, I have a vague memory, but I'm not sure. And so it doesn't make sense to have a special meeting without the full commission. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I, I can tell you that uh, um, I, I will be out on the 14th, so um, that date may not work because um, you might just be in the same situation again. <laughs> so, um, so let's just. Uh, so at this point, staff, I, I don't think we have any additional items on the agenda uh, for tonight. Um, we can hear from commissioners um, and probably potentially hear this at our next regular meeting. I mean, is that an option as well? Um, I see Mr. Marlette. Let's hear from him before we go to the commissioners here. Well, with, um, with the um, same issue at our next regular meeting um, on the 7th, the meeting after that would be on the 21st. So we'd want to continue this to a date certain. That would be the date. Okay, so we would we would uh, need a motion to continue this to a date certain. Is that, is that where we're at right now? Or does, does that, is that a decision just made by staff? I think cleaner. under the bylaws, it would be continued to the next regular meeting. Yeah. So, but, but since, the next, since we're not, there's not availability at the next regular meeting, it'd probably be cleaner just to do it by motion to continue it okay. To first. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and uh, hear from commissioners who've been patiently waiting, and then um, we can see if we can get a motion to continue it for a date certain. Um, I missed the order in which they came up so i'm just going to go left to right on my screen here so commissioner conway commissioner missidi miller and then commissioner kennedy so commissioner conway first i just have a go question ahead. um uh so i'm wondering uh i mean we we've, we've processed this whole item it's going to get passed on city council why does it need to ret return to the commission i think i, I must have just missed that explanation and you can get that answered later. Just a question. No, that's okay. Um, staff, could you go ahead and chime in on that? And then we'll go to Commissioner Mercedes Miller. Um, sure, I'll, I'll try this one. And then if Matt has something to add, he can. So um, first of all, of course, we would like to have a recommendation um, from the commission, uh, either with amendments or of the whole package. Secondly, because this includes recommendations for rezonings, we need a finding from your commission before we can take those to the city council. Okay, Not to thank you. Did, that answer, did, did that, that answer your question, Commissioner Conway? Okay, great. Um, Commissioner Missidi Miller. In terms of scheduling, um, revisiting this item, as I understand it, there's not enough room at the next planning commission meeting for this item to be revisited. Um, I'm wondering why. It doesn't seem like it would take that long to vote um, on this item at the next available public meeting of the public uh, planning commission. Um, and if a special meeting needs to be called, um, what would be the optimum time um, and does does Sarah, uh, I mean, do the, does staff, did the staff that present tonight have to be there? And do we have to, you know, do we have to arrange a planning commission meeting so that every planning commissioner can be in attendance? Um, I think we just need a quorum to do business. Is that right? Well, I guess I have three questions there. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and turn that over to staff to answer those questions. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Noisy. Sure. So um, in answer to your first question, um, it, of course, it is that the, the commission's prerogative to take something up at their next regularly scheduled meeting. Um, there will not be staff support for this item at the next regularly scheduled meeting on the 7th of July. Both Matt Van Waugh and myself are going to be on vacation. And uh, also, it sounds like one of our 
planning commissioners may also not be in attendance. And so that may not be, we may find ourselves in exactly the same situation. So that was one of the reasons we weren't recommending um, that date. Um, I think your second question was, do we just need a quorum to do business? That's, right. that is technically correct. Um, and, uh, and I believe, but I believe we always need four votes. It's a four, it's a seven member panel. So we need four votes to pass a motion. Is that right? Matt and Eric, I'm looking at you. Okay. I do just want to add the, the bylaws do also say if, if, a, if these motions were continued, and there was a commissioner absent again, and they tied again, then the bylaws do say that that motion would, that motion fails by a tie. And, and then it, it would go on to, to council from there. So the, this continuance would only happen once if, if there were another tie. Mm -hmm. okay. And, and to add to what Matt said, um, I'm looking at the planning commission bylaws and they do actually stipulate that for tie votes, um, the matter automatically gets continued to the next meeting. So that would be on July 7th. And oh. um, uh, both the planning director and myself are available to staff that meeting. So we could, we could have that meeting on the 7th. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Musidi Miller, did you get all your questions answered? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Kennedy. Oh, I'm just still noodling around these dates. I just want to move this through as soon as we can, but I have uh, lost my good idea for getting that done. Listening to everybody else. Okay, um, so right now, uh, before the commission is uh, the idea to bring it on the 7th, um, or if somebody would like to make a motion to bring it on the 20, well, let me get the calendar up here. Uh, 21st. On, yeah, okay. Um, the 21st, okay. So a uh, couple hands going up. Again, I was looking down, so I'm just gonna go left or right on my screen. So Commissioner Kennedy. Uh, I will move uh, to, uh, can Continue this item to the 21st, date certain. Okay, uh, Commissioner Mash. Okay, that's a se second on that. Uh, Commissioner Conway, did you have a comment before we vote on this uh, motion to continue to a date certain on the 21st of July? Okay, sorry. Uh, Commissioner Kenny, your hands up. Is that just... Uh, oh. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right, so motion on the floor to continue this item to a date certain on July, a regular scheduled, regularly scheduled meeting, July 21st, which apparently is hard to say at 942. Um, uh, clerk, can I have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Conway? I am gonna vote no, because I unfortunately have to miss that meeting. So I would prefer it was a different date. Oh, yeah. Commissioner Kennedy? Aye, we gotta move this ahead and people should just zoom in. Sorry, Julie. Maxwell? Commissioner okay. Maxwell? Aye. Vasidi Miller? Aye. Different? Aye. And Chair Dawson? Aye. All right, so we have a uh, motion passes um, with uh, five to one, um, and that is continuing this the item number two, the objective standards to date certain on a regular ske regularly scheduled meeting, July 21st. And um, that is all we have on the agenda for this evening. I want to thank the public and staff for um, for attending. Again, a big thank you to staff for uh, the thorough work. And um, I will call this meeting into adjournment. Thank you.